unlike the Senate, the House starts exactly on time. It is uh, 2 o'clock, and uh, we got a chuckle there. That's good. Um, well, welcome to the uh, Transportation Finance and Policy Division uh, meeting here uh, in our mini session in Winona. I'm so pleased to see so many folks have turned out, both from the public and uh, we have many members of our committee and a few guests also uh, here as well sitting around the table. Uh, I'm Frank Hornstein, the chair, and I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, we, this is a regular meeting of our committee, so uh, you'll be able to see many of the things we typically do in St. Paul. Uh, we will hear from our, our local officials here in Winona, uh, and then we will um, uh, hear uh, from uh, uh, a couple of members of our committee who will present bills, and then there'll be public testimony uh, for and potentially against those bills, and uh, and then we will open it up for the public uh, to speak. And those are the three general things we do at any meeting. Uh, before we start, we'll have introductions of everybody here uh, around the table. But before we do that, I want to call on the mayor of Winona to give us some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, Chairman Hornsey, the members of the Transportation Committee. Uh, like you, we start all our council meetings exactly on time. <laughs> Reward those that arrive on time. Um, I was asked to give a brief uh, welcome, which I will do. Uh, I know you have a lot of business ahead of you this afternoon and a lot of testimony to hear. So I just want to uh, say, like I did last night, to probably many of you that were at the History Center, uh, welcome to our city of Winona. It's, uh, a pleasure to have all of you here. It's a, a, a big deal for us, and I hope for you too, to come here and, and to learn about more about Winona and southeastern Minnesota, southern Minnesota. And I think it's a I think it's a great thing for uh, the citizens to uh, to be able to come here and, and watch you in action. Many of them don't get to the capital to do that, and I think it's a great way to sort of get through the bipartisanship that uh, often out there and preventing good things from happening. So uh, we're here. I want to thank the city staff for everything that they've done. They've worked very hard to, uh, to work with the legislative staff. And, uh, I think they've done a great job. And uh, it's, again, a pleasure. And, and uh, I'll see you tonight at the Marine Art Museum and uh, hopefully around tomorrow as well. But thank you for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Pearson. I want to um, echo your uh, thanks to the staff and uh, all of the wonderful warm hospitality we've had for everyone from Winona. So thank you so much. Um, what I'd like to do next uh, is to have uh, folks go around the room and uh, around the uh, uh, table here and introduce themselves. And um, the members will say uh, their names and what district they represent. We also have fantastic staff members here as well, and they'll introduce themselves and, and just uh, briefly uh, talk about what they do uh, here at the House of Representatives. So why don't we start uh, with uh, Representative Wolgamont and then we'll move around. And um, actually, let's, before we do that, I wanted to uh, uh, call on uh, my colleague, the, uh, the ranking member, um, Representative Torkelson, to also uh, make some opening remarks, uh, as we typically do at these field hearings. And then we'll start with Representative Wolgamont. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Chair Hornstein. Appreciate that. I am Paul Torkelson. I serve uh, District 16B in South Central Minnesota, Brown, Redwood, and uh, some of Renville counties. Uh, our Republican lead on this committee, Frank and I traded places after the last election. He had been the Democrat lead. He's now become the chair. I was the chair, and I have now become the lead. Uh, elections have consequences, as we like to say at the legislature. So uh, it's been great to be here in Winona in southeast Minnesota. It's my second trip to southeast Minnesota in just recent weeks. The Water Commission was down here just uh, last week, the week before. So it's been a real treat to be here. I thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, for hosting us, and thanks to the community members and people that put a lot of work in to put this together. Uh, thank you, Representative Torkelson. And now we'll start with uh, Representative Wolgamont. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Representative Dan Wolgamont. I serve District 14B, which is the St. Cloud area. And I'm Representative Michael Nelson. I represent uh, District 40A, which is the southern half of Brooklyn Park. Representative Bob Bogle. I represent uh, 20A. I live in Elko Newmark and represent southern Scott and western Lee Sewer counties. <coughs> 
Good afternoon. I'm Sandra Mason, and I represent 51A, which is most of Egan, west of 35E, and all of northern Burnsville. Um, I'm Representative Steve Elkins from uh, Bloomington District 49B, which also includes portions of uh, Edina, Minnetonka, and Eden Prairie. I'm Representative Erin Kago. I represent 37A, which is Blaine, um, Spring Lake Park, and Coon Rapids, the north metro area. I'm Alice Hausman. I represent a couple of neighborhoods in St. Paul, St. Anthony Park and Como Park, and three suburban cities, uh, Falcon Heights, Lauderdale, and most of Roseville. If you've been to the State Fair, you've been to my district. Hello, I'm Brad Tabke, representative for uh, Shakopee, Jackson Township, and Louisville Township uh, on the southwest side of Minneapolis. And uh, thank you so much for having us here. Winona has given us a really, really great welcome, and uh, we appreciate everyone for spending their time and hanging out with us. I'm Lindy Selmick. I'm the committee legislative assistant, so I assist this committee and uh, Chair Frank Weinstein in all of his legislative duties. And we welcome uh, Ms. Salmick. She just uh, started last month and is doing a great job and did a lot of work to put this together. Um, again, Frank Hornstein, I uh, represent the district uh, in Minneapolis, parts of downtown and southwest Minneapolis. Hi, folks. Uh, John Howe, the committee administrator. I've had a great privilege of uh, communicating with many of you and look forward to hearing from you today. And a big thank you to, to Mr. Howe, who's done incredible work over the last couple months uh, putting this hearing together and all of our activities that the Transportation Committee has been involved with here in Winona. So thank you, Mr. Howe. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Runback, a state representative from 38A, which is the northern suburbs, Lino Lakes, Circle Pines, and various, several other cities up there. So, I'm Nolan West. I represent most of Blaine in the Minnesota legislature. My name is John Kosnick, represent Lakeville, which is 25 miles south of Minneapolis and St. Paul, just off Interstate 35. And I'm Matt Burris with House Research, which is one of the nonpartisan offices in the House. Uh, Joe Markle, I'm the, uh, uh, used to be the committee administrator for Paul, I'm now the researcher for the House GOP for transportation. I'm Jennifer Nelson, I'm the DFL researcher with this committee. So thank you, everyone, for those introductions. And uh, now we'll uh, start with some uh, uh, local officials from the city of Winona, and then we'll hear from uh, some uh, of our uh, esteemed guests. We have two state commissioners that have made the uh, trip down here, and we'll hear from them in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, as we have learned uh, uh, through the day today and, and through much of our work uh, in this committee, there's a very, very important connection between transportation and local economic development. It is critical, uh, as we know, for, for commerce and for jobs. And so uh, we know that Winona has been exemplary in this area, uh, the way that the, uh, the Port Authority has, um, you know, looked at uh, some of the redevelopment that we've seen downtown and, of course, all of the, the farm and other uh, products that are shipped uh, along the river on the port, these are all critical transportation issues and needs. So uh, we will um, have uh, Mr. Al Thurley first, uh, who serves on the Winona City Council, and he's also a Port Authority Commissioner. So welcome to the committee. Thank you. It's the first time I've had legislature in the round here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name again is Al Thurley. I'm a member of the City Council and Port Authority of Winona. And in fact, I participated as a council member during the last mini session in Winona 30 years ago. But I haven't been on the council in all those <laughs> in just eight years. But uh, it's a great event, and thank you again for coming back to Winona. And thank you for the opportunity to tell you about the Winona port facilities as well as the other active public ports that serve the state of Minnesota. Now here's, here's some information to start with about how valuable our port facilities are to the entire state. The Mississippi River and the Great Lakes waterway system provide us with access to national and international markets with the lowest cost transportation <coughs> available. Now at the Port of Winona, some of the major commodities that move through the state and into the state through our facilities are road salt, we need that in Minnesota. Fertilizer, we need that in Minnesota. Distiller's grain, it's an interesting product of the ethanol process. 
and a product called Gyp Soil, which is fairly recent, but it's a soil treatment. And we have also seen a significant increase in shipments of wind turbine components, such as the blades. They come up the Mississippi River on barges. It's an amazing sight to see four or five of these huge wind turbines on specially built cradles on these barges coming up from uh, New Orleans and then offloaded here in Winona. It's kind of neat. And then they're transported by truck from Winona to wind farms in western Minnesota, in Iowa, and in the Dakotas. Now some of the things that go out of the Winona port are primarily grain shipments. Corn, soybeans for the most part. And uh, unfortunately, given the challenges facing farmers these days, uh, having a low-cost option for movement of their products to market is a significant benefit. The Port of Winona and our colleagues in Red Wing, St. Paul, and Duluth rely on the Port Development Assistance Program to repair and upgrade our port infrastructure. This program was enacted in the early 90s and the legislature has provided matching funds, thank you, usually in the form of general obligation bonds to improve dock walls, enhance our heavy lift capabilities, store products for transshipment, construct stormwater drainage systems, and construct facilities to accommodate barge fleeting activities. And we have, from time to time, received general fund appropriations which have come through the Transportation Finance Committee. Those appropriations are always welcome, as the general fund allows us to finance equipment for moving products at ports, something that general obligation bonds cannot pay for. The ports are unified in their support for the Port Development Assistance Fund. We have a short list of projects to use up to $14 million of state general obligation bond proceeds in the coming session. The projects we have lined up will enhance our ability to serve a vital role in Minnesota's multimodal transportation system. Now, one of our handouts shows you examples of projects at the Port of Winona, past, present, and future, that has or will receive funding through the Port Development Assistance Program. Now, we acknowledge that the ports need rail and truck service in order to serve the role we play in moving commodities into and out of the state. But, to give you a sense of the scale of port operations, we have a handout that compares the movement of commodities by barge versus rail or truck. The easiest reference is provided in the handout, which examines the equivalent capacity of one barge on the Mississippi River, which carries the same amount of product as 16 rail cars, or 70 large semi-trailer track units. The benefits of our public ports were best described by a former member of the Minnesota Ports Association, Duluth Port Director Davis Helberg, who passed away late last year. He would always say, quote, waterborne commerce uses less energy, causes less environmental degradation, generates less waste disposal, is responsible for fewer accidents, creates the least societal disruption, and is almost cheap, unquote. In addition, having this option available reduces wear and tear on a highway system. We are grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about our port facility, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing our committee and the whole legislature to Winona. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thurley. Uh, do we have any quick questions uh, for the council member and Port Authority Commissioner? Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Brian DeFrang, uh, the Winona City Engineer. Welcome to the Chairman. committee, Mr. Dufresne. Please state your name for the record. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Brian Dufresne, city engineer for Winona, and 
welcome to Winona. Appreciate you being here. We wish we could give you a little better weather, but it uh, makes it easier to be inside. Um, tell you a little bit about how transportation works in Winona. Approximately 20% of our streets are Minnesota state aid funded. That gives us money from the state aid through the gas tax at about $900,000 per year is what's given to the city of Winona. That's to be spent on reconstruction or matching of funds when a trunk highway or a county highway is <coughs> done in town and we're obligated to pay a portion of it. That also leaves 116 miles of street that are not funded by state aid. That um, costs approximately $2 million a mile for a city street to be reconstructed totally which over 116 miles gives us approximately a quarter of a billion dollars worth of our reconstruction costs to fully reconstruct our streets. There's a lot of streets that need to be reconstructed in the Allstate. Many cities just like Winona face the same problem. And we don't have a great dedicated source of funding. Recently, the counties have been given the opportunity to do a half cent sales tax, which the cities have not been able to do and it costs approximately 50% to do a rural highway mile as it does to do a city street mile with the curb and gutter, the storm sewer, the sidewalks, the wider pavement to accommodate parking, et cetera. So a city street is much more expensive to do than a rural section, whether that's a MnDOT highway or a county highway. Um, the county roads in Winona, are about, we have about 30% as many roads as they have and they, they have a funding source which we do not have. So I, I wish the council would consider some sort of um, amendment to that to where we could either give a, a sales tax or possibly different funding from the gas tax, which may have been talked about. Also, the bridge bonding bill, bill Winona's had a bridge on there for over two years that has not been funded because the bonding bill has not funded bridge bonding very well in the last few years. It has been funded, but not at a level that it's needed. It's uh, something that we would uh, like to be looked at. Any questions? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. DeFrank. Questions from the uh, committee? We appreciate your testimony and your work. Um, Next we have uh, Monica Hennessy Moen. Uh, she's the city clerk and also the administrator of Winona Transit. So welcome and, and uh, for the public and, uh, and of course members, we uh, are interested. We fund uh, uh, transit in the metro area as well as uh, through the Metropolitan Council uh, primarily but, uh, and, and some of the opt-out uh, transit services. But, also, we uh, have a strong interest in Greater Minnesota Transit, and that is uh, through MnDOT. And uh, we're very interested in, in hearing uh, your, um, your perspective on transit here in Winona. So welcome to the committee. Again, my name is Monica Hennessy Mohan. I am the city clerk here in Winona. And because we're a smaller city, I also do a number of duties, uh, one of which is administering our Winona Transit service. In a former life, I used to work for the city of Minneapolis, and I lived in the lovely Kenwood neighborhood. Oh, well, we're considering. <laughs> uh, so Winona Transit, I did have a double-sided handout for you, and I also provided copies of our current routes. Uh, Winona Transit serves both the cities of Winona and Goodview, yeah. and now with our new dial-a-ride service, we're providing service up to two miles outside of our current city limits. So we provide three different types of service. The first is what we call a deviated route service, where we have four routes, but they will deviate up to four blocks off that route for an additional surcharge. We currently run Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6.15 p.m., and Saturday, 9 to 5. Uh, we just started running something called Dial-A-Ride, which is a demand response service. And this runs the same days and hours as our other routes. And that service is for all of Winona and Goodview and up to two miles out. We also run a number of college subscription routes. 
and these are under an agreement with Winona State University as well as St. Mary's. We run three routes for Winona State during the school year, and this is between their main campus, the West Campus, which is the former St. Teresa's University, and their East Lake Apartments. And an uh, important route that we run is called the Safe Ride, and that's a free service that runs on Friday and Saturday evenings between the universities in downtown. Our current service, we have eight class 500 buses and one class 400. So a total of nine buses that we're providing nine routes. Our fares currently are $1 for the deviated routes and $1.30 for the dial -a ride At the bottom of that page, you'll see our stats from last year. And overall, we provide 13, over 13 trips per hour, which is good for an outstate uh, transit service. So the current funding for all these routes, uh, we receive 80% of our operating costs through a grant by MnDOT. A lot of that is through FTA uh, grant funds. And through the state of Minnesota, it's both general fund money and the Greater Minnesota Transit Fund. I would note in 2019, MnDOT increased that, local, or that grant money to include 90% of our operating costs. So, vast majority of our costs are covered through MnDOT grant. Uh, the balance is a local share, and in Winona we cover that through our bus fares and some limited advertising on the buses. Winona State is paying 100% of those routes. And the capital cost for bus replacements is typically also at 80%. Some of the current projects we've had in the last year, it's been busy for Winona Transit. We implemented a new transit advisory committee uh, made up of local residents and service organizations. Uh, through MnDOT and the MIPTA, the Minnesota Public Transit Association, we were able to complete a five-year transit plan. We're just finalizing our plan. It'll be coming to our city council the next month. And earlier this year, we received a special grant from MnDOT to increase the number of shelters and signage that we have throughout our system. The total of grant was 242000 Again, that was on an 80-20 match. And we recently um, completed a route redesign. It's the first time in a couple decades that we've changed the structure. We have delayed implementing those routes until we get some of those new shelters actually in place. I'm also a member of the Southeast Minnesota Regional Transit Coordinating Council, RTCC, that MnDOT is uh, working on throughout the state. Uh, we have one of the largest uh, <coughs> coordinating councils in the state. It, I believe has uh, eight uh, counties that are participating in that. And Olmstead County is uh, in the process of developing the grant application for year two of the planning. <coughs> We have a grant application into MnDOT for some bus replacements for next year. We have not heard back yet on the status, but I am happy to announce that our application for expanding our service to the evening through our evening dollar ride has been approved and we will be looking to implement that in early January of 2020. So again, thank you for all the support of our transit system. Obviously, we cannot provide those services without the financial assistance from the state and also the staff assistance from the MnDOT Office of Transit. Thank you very much, Ms. Hennessy Mohan. Are there questions? Yes, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your presentation. It's uh, very informative. I was just curious on the, the, the safe ride to the university and back. The, my under, if I understood you right, the university pays so for that? So both Winona State and St. Mary's pay about 70% of it. The balance is from our transit grant. Thank you. And then just as a difference from coming from a, a metro suburban district, um, it doesn't appear, I tried to pull it up here, so uh, Uber and Lyft network transportation providers are not utilized in the city of Winona, or, oh. or, or, or there's not a driver available, at least right now. Right. Uh, I believe we do have some Lyft drivers, but it is pretty minimal. Okay. Thank, Thank you. It's a good question.
Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, uh, mm -hmm. Representative Runbeck, sorry, thank I didn't you, see you. Uh, just wanted to question, so the, um, the WSU routes, do they use a different type of vehicle than the deviated routes? No, I'm just they're, noticing. All, they're all public transit buses are all uh, signed with Winona Transit logos. Okay. The, the operating costs, even though the passenger trips are about the same, operating costs are, are much more in the deviated routes. I'm just curious why that would be. Lieutenant Simon. So the annual operating costs for the deviated routes, they run um, year-round, and they run more hours per day. So the one hour state subscription routes are only during the school year, and they run on different hours. One of the routes is only two hours a day, one is four hours, the other is 12 hours. So quite a bit more hours of routes of service for the deviated routes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that concludes our uh, panel from the city of Winona. And it was reminded when we had the municipal officials here that we have a former municipal official who is a member of the legislature who is sitting in the audience, uh, Representative Carlson from Bloomington. And uh, he um, uh, formerly was a member of this uh, committee uh, in the past. We miss him, but I know he's doing good work in other committees, but we welcome him uh, to our meeting. So now we'll hear from some county officials. Uh, we already had a uh, tour uh, this morning, um, uh, but we want to, uh, you know, elaborate and expand on some of that. Of course, counties uh, receive 29% uh, of the uh, state aid transportation formula and are very, very critical partners. So our um, first uh, representative from the Winona County Board is Chris Meyer, a county commissioner. It's, uh, Mr. Meyer. Um, so we have the uh, the Thanks. yeah. Uh, members and chair, I want to welcome you to Winona. Uh, I am, my name is Chris Meyer, and I am a Winona County Commissioner. I really have just three simple thoughts that I wanted to share with you today about transportation and transit in Winona County. First, and very simply, we need more road. Winona, as a number of other counties have, has levied a sales tax, and that does help us to assist in our road maintenance and construction. And so every year we do get a little bit more done than we did before, but in reality, we are just falling behind more slowly. So consistent and higher funding is needed for us to keep up our infrastructure. Across all of southeastern Minnesota, some 50% of our workforce commutes to some other county every day for work, and that is even higher in the North County. Of the 15,500 jobs that we have, about two-thirds of our workers come from someplace else in the region, and about 8,800 workers leave Winona County every day to go somewhere else in the region for their job. We lack a regional transit system for commuters, and that creates an equity issue. It makes car ownership a prerequisite for some employment. And though MnDOT is working on the uh, coordination council, the focus of that is really not on commuters. Additionally, we are experiencing a workforce shortage, and that is expected to just get worse in future years. So transit for commuters that would work for us regionally is important and it would be important for us to address second and third shift issues so that we can get folks to be working for the businesses that we need to support and that, that will help us maintain our economic development. So state support in planning and developing and funding roads and transit are really important to all of southeastern Minnesota, but especially to us. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yes, uh, Vice Chair. Representative Tabke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with you that we absolutely have to have more funding for transportation throughout the state of Minnesota. What ways in your mind do you see is the best mechanism and way for helping to make that happen? Like, What, what do you see the funding best uh, uh, created as? So for regional transit? Uh, for mostly for roads and bridges and, okay. and make funding roads that way, but also for transit as well. Sure. Um, so I'm not sure if Dave Kramer, who is our county highway engineer who's here today, he's going to speak. Um, I rely on his expertise um, in terms of many of those details. 
So I'm not sure what the right mechanism is for funding, but I know that we need it to be consistent and um, that we, we need help. And Mr. Kramer will be testifying next. Okay. There we go. Perfect. And just to kind of follow up on that, like politically is, in your mind, is gas tax a way to go? Is what do you think is the is the right way that people in your county can, can handle and what they think is a good idea? Sure. Well, personally, I'm not opposed to the gas tax, and I understood that there was a straw poll at the uh, state fair this year, and that 60% of Minnesotans who took part in the poll said they'd favor 5% or more, right? I think, too, as we look uh, towards electric vehicles, maybe um, a vehicle miles travel tax would be a more equitable way for us to figure out how to fund those. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and you, oh, Representative Cagle. Um, thank you. I this morning we heard a bit um, during the um, jobs committee about the uh, driver's license for all issue, mm -hmm. and um, was just wondering, you know, if that would help some of the um, workforce issues that you are facing here. As well. Yeah. So I was just elected in the 2018 cycle. Um, I sit on the workforce board here in Winona County, and um, I have had a lot to learn just becoming an elected official. And there are three things that they tell me are really critical to us being able to get uh, those folks who maybe could work but don't. And one of those is transportation, one of them is housing, and one of them is child care. So certainly um, the issues with um, being, being able to have a driver's license, I was really surprised that this, uh, the last workforce <coughs> meeting, which was uh, on Monday, um, one of the folks from D that runs our Career Force Center was talking about how Ashley Furniture has um, been recruiting folks from Puerto Rico. Um, they're bringing them to Winona and they're bringing them to Arcadia. So certainly our employers are trying to help recruit folks to come from outside the region. So certainly, I mean, folks from Puerto Rico are going to have uh, an American uh, passport, so that would be fine. But for folks who come here from other countries and are working, yeah, it would be really important for them to be able to have a driver's license, to be able to insure their vehicles, and really, I thought it was great that Sheriff Andrew talked about why that's so important for law Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. Representative Torfus. Thank you. Just briefly, um, I'm aware that uh, there are commuter buses that run to Mayo and Rochester. Uh, that I believe it's a private system. Does that operate here in Winona? I, I think it's Rochester City Lines. Um, and that they do have buses that run um, on a Mayo schedule. Um, I don't know that that's available maybe in as wide a format as, as is needed, and I'm not sure what buses there are that would run to La Crosse. But I think that probably to Rochester and La Crosse, for folks who leave Winona, those are the places that they're going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we all thank you very much you. For, for your service and for your uh, testimony. Uh, our final um, Winona County uh, testifier um, is Mr. Dave Kramer. And of course we welcome back to the committee. Uh, you gave a wonderful uh, presentation this morning. A couple of things I, I wanted uh, Mr. Kramer to touch on uh, that he didn't touch on today this morning is that um, uh, I'm especially interested, uh, given um, so, so much of the rain that has fallen in this part of the state and throughout southern Minnesota, um, and we'll be hearing again from our state agencies on this as well, um, how, I think it was, I, I checked with the National Weather Service in La Crosse, they said last year was the third wettest on record. I'm hearing now that it's now the wettest on record uh, in this part of the state so far in 2019. Uh, so I think there's some issues with that and how we address that in, in road construction and repair. And then just in general, um, overview of the engineering issues uh, related to roads here in the county. So a couple of things to, that we can uh, amplify that you had mentioned this morning. And welcome to the committee, and thanks again for spending so much time with us. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. Uh, regarding the, uh, the funding as a whole, um, just to expand a little bit, uh, the Winona County Board did approve the, the half cent sales tax for transportation. I believe that was in 2016. Uh, some information that I put together at that time for the board's consideration, um, we looked at a kind of a life cycle cost analysis for our, our bridges, our roads, uh, um, 
uh, both you know bridge replacement, uh, overlays on roads, and reconstruction of roads, and we came up with a, basically an annual need of 8.8 .8 million. Looked at all of our revenue sources, which the bulk of that is the county state aid highway funds, which come from the highway user tax distribution funds, um, and the revenue is about 4.4 million, so it's about a 50 percent gap. And um, we do have empirical data, not, not empirical data, uh, actual numerical data um, from road conditions that uh, uh, numerical data every four years that MnDOT provides that shows our roads in good condition are, are becoming uh, less percent and our roads in poor, to very poor condition are increasing. So we're, we're definitely falling behind. The board did approve the half cent sales tax. Um, right now that's tracking for the last year of very close to 3.0 million that that will generate. In comparison, our CASA construction funds are about 3.6 million. So it's a it's a huge shot in the arm to, um, as as uh, Commissioner Meyer mentioned, you know we're, we're falling behind less slowly, much less slowly, but we're still, you know, we're not in catch up mode. We're in, you know, uh, fall behind slower mode. So just to, to be, be clear about that, um, as far as you know, revenue, uh, you know, or, or potential sources, certainly the gas tax is kind of the workhorse of the highway users tax distribution fund with the uh, uh, electric or uh, you know hybrid vehicles obviously you know there needs to be a, a look at something that's mileage based but you know for what will work now I, I believe that that's that's the workhorse and if you look at the variation of the uh, you know the gas prices and if a 5 10 15 cent uh, increase were to be you know worked in over time I, I really don't can't imagine people would even realize that frankly unless they read the paper and saw the gas taxes being increased. A um, couple other things I'd like to talk about uh, with the, the, now you should all have the handouts. Uh, bridge bond funding, I've got a, a real, real concern about that and would like to put a, a pitch in for that. Um, as we were trying to, uh, uh, work it, when I was working with uh, Mr. Howe to schedule the, uh, schedule the tour, I would have liked to have gotten you all out and, and, and looked at the underside of uh, one of our bridges. Um, I gave him some GPS coordinates and he pl plunked them in. He said, I don't think that's the right spot. It, it was too far away from Winona. I said, no, that's my bridge. Um, on the f first page here, the top sheet's kind of a, a map showing all of our bridges. I got it circled in red there. It's on our county five, just north of the county line with Houston County, our bridge 85502. Um, it is load posted right now for 16, 28, 28, which means 16 tons for a single vehicle, 28 tons for a vehicle with a trailer or a semi. To put that in comparison, a normally legally loaded tandem axle truck can haul 26 tons. So that is significantly less than that. And then a, a normally legally loaded semi, 80,000 80, pounds or 40 tons. So the, the 26 40, 40 that was on the bridge that I pointed out uh, on a tour is basically matches the, the normal legal loads. Uh, like a milk truck with extra axles can go higher than that. Uh, if you put more axles on a single unit vehicle, they can go up to 80,000 pounds, which is why that bridge is low cost to save. It's not safe for that smaller vehicle that would put all that load on a single bridge span. Uh, so I do have concern about this bridge. Um, I like to get my county commissioners out on a road tour once a year, and usually we'll go under a bridge and, and look at some of the things. And you know, you look at the on the first page, um, the bottom. You know, you look at the picture of the bridge there. You know, that, that looks just fine. Um, get underneath it, and the, uh, you know, there's some pretty serious deterioration. Uh, the bottom side of the bridge there is falling, and the, the reinforcing steel is rusted. And then I have a picture on the bottom of page two. The bridge pile there is, uh, and that's what's holding. The bridge up is literally rusted through. So we've had this bridge in our replacement program we were planning for 2015. Uh, we've been deferring that since then due to the bridge bond funding not clearing out the backlog. Um, so right now we have it tentatively planned for 2021 based on you know some uh, bridge bond funding in the 2020 legislature. Um, typically, the request that comes out is, you know, in the 50 to 100 million range. I believe the, the current backlog is actually about that big. So, um, you know, I would, I know it's kind of a mundane thing that sits there year after year, and it's maybe not as flashy as uh, uh, other projects, but it really is a bread and butter thing that's critical for our infrastructure. Just wanted to mention that. Um, 
the other thing that was, was uh, asked about was the, the flooding. On the next page three, um, that specific bridge, that's a picture of what it looked like after the August uh, 18, 2007 flood. It was just sitting there on its pile. Um, the, uh, the next page, uh, on the bottom of page three, you can see that the bridge approaches are completely washed out. Uh, you can see on the end of the bridge there is that bridge identification plaque is the one that they have the, on the picture on the first page. So we filled that back in and, you know, it's, it has the traffic back on it. Top of page four, you can, uh, I kind of pictured some on the top of the pier there, there's some spalling from, from some stresses that were put on that bridge during that flood. That's not the main thing we're concerned about, but it is some deterioration that's, that's of concern. Um, moving ahead to this year, we've had two disaster events this year. Uh, we had the spring, essentially the spring runoff event, which is, was a, a declared disaster for most of the counties in Minnesota. It's, it's a, also a federal disaster. Our damage on that was actually relatively small, in the, probably the $70,000 range. Um, we also had a, a, a thunderstorm come through on July 19th, early, early that morning, um, in the south, central, southeast part of the county, dumped uh, about six, six inches of rain, what the locals were telling me that was on top of a couple inches the day before, so not very much soaked in. Starting on the page, bottom of page four, you can see some uh, photos there, some of the damage. Um, page five, those are all that same, that same road. <coughs> Uh, page six is uh, one of our roads through the valley that overtops, so we're basically back in there putting gravel in that next morning, trying to get that back open. Um, as far as the, the and, and this specific flood, is about $500,000 of, of damage to our county road system. Uh, we're repairing about two, 200000 of that in-house and about 300000 of that we have contracted out. Um, it's my understanding that uh, uh, in, uh, paperwork to get a, a, a disaster declaration to the governor is, was submitted to him recently for his signature. Um, I want to put a plug in for the state disaster program. Um, for a, uh, This was localized, so this will not be a federal disaster, but there is you know, significant um, disaster, uh, damage on the county side. And to have that state disaster program where we will be eligible for 75% reimbursement. That is, you know, that's a great program to have when we have things like this happen. You know, the 25%, you know, we can absorb with some reserves, but to, to take care of the brunt of it, it is nice to have, you know, kind of essentially kind of a public infrastructure self-insurance pool with that, um, with that disaster program. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, again, appreciate your testimony today and, and your accompanying us on the very informative tour this morning. <laughs> Are there questions from the uh, committee? Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At what point do you have to start closing bridges? Well, this one, like it, it, we, the, the load posting that we have on it is the, the load, that load is safe to cross. Um, I, basically, the, the, you have to close a bridge before it becomes unsafe. Um, they can be load posted down to a three ton limit on a bridge like this where it's got uh, you know, quite a bit of truck traffic on it. That's not a realistic posting, but you know, when, when they do become unsafe for any traffic, like for even a car to drive across it, yeah, we would, we would close it. Um, it looks like here that there's 17 deficient bridges. Are any of them getting to the point that you might consider having to close them for safety? Mr. Kramer. Uh, none of them are that close. Uh, probably the closest one we have is um, in the very southwest corner there. You see the, the one that says a weight limit, five tons. That's on a township road. Um, very limited traffic. And that's one where it, it, you know, it probably will be closed and not replaced <coughs> when it's no longer safe for traffic. But we do annual bridge inspections, and you know, so we're monitoring them. They peri periodically get a structural engineer to analyze them for you know uh, load rating, and then we'll update the, the signage. So you know, there's a there's a rigorous inspection and and uh, an analysis program, and you know, we, we don't leave them open if they're not safe to be open for the load that they have posted for the normal legal load. Thank you, and again, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. 
Well, I appreciate the uh, testimony from the city and county officials. Um, I, I think cities and counties, local government, are really on the front lines in many ways of uh, our transportation challenges that we have, and, um, and we want to continue to work with you as, as partners here at the state level and, of course, get, get you the resources you need to, to be successful. And so, speaking of states, uh, state level folks, we definitely wanted uh, to hear from our uh, two commissioners over, uh, we have jurisdiction over a number of different agencies and, en and entities at the state level. First and foremost is MnDOT and also the Department of Public Safety. We also, as I mentioned earlier, fund the Met Council. That's not a, a state agency per se, but um, uh, the Met Council chair does sit in the governor's uh, cabinet. So. Well, those are the three main agencies. Of course, there's others as well. Uh, but we do have today the uh, commissioners of uh, transportation and public safety. And I'll call on Commissioner uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher first. And um, again, we typically hear from agencies on, on many bills. Uh, they will um, give us overview um, uh, presentations at the beginning of each session. Um, then from time to time, they, they issue reports. Uh, and then they will brief us about those reports. And we have one such report as well. Uh, and, and members, a lot has happened uh, since we last met uh, in spring. And so, and, and, and a lot of activities at MnDOT too, too many uh, to, to go through today. But um, I thought that the um, uh, report that they issued on uh, climate was important and, and carbon. Uh, and so we'll hear from uh, Commissioner uh, Anderson Kelleher on that. Um, and just to preface the comments, um, we'll have uh, the commissioner go through her PowerPoint, and then we'll save questions till the end, uh, if, if members have those. And um, I also, um, as, as a, again, a, a prerequisite to this uh, uh, presentation, um, transportation is now the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions and it is the fastest growing source. And so uh, I think this is why this Pathways uh, report is so important uh, and so timely given, again, the realities of, of uh, the climate crisis that we've experienced not only in Minnesota over the summer with our extreme weather events, uh, particularly the flooding, but of course we've, we've had fires and where we shouldn't have fires <laughs> over the uh, summer uh, around the world. and. Um, you know, more and more reports almost every day of uh, accelerating climate change. So that's part of what uh, is behind this report, and uh, we'll uh, take a look at that now. So welcome to the committee. Welcome to Winona, Commissioner Anderson Kelleher. Well, Mr. Chairman and members, thank you. Thank you for having me down here. Um, thank you to the mayor, to council members, to the county commissioners and county staff who are here. I appreciate their work. Um, I, I'm no stranger to Winona. Um, one of the most significant times when I was here was when the region experienced flooding when I was Speaker of the House. And uh, actually, um, I, am, I, I was thrilled today when we saw many of the things that they have done since that time that have helped them be more resilient. And so um, a lot of, I want to preface this by saying a lot of the work in transportation today that's forward looking, like you just heard a lot of things that are very immediate about how uh, counties and cities are responding to immediate needs in transportation, both funding shortages, issues with flooding, and you're going to hear a little more about that in my presentation. But a lot of the work that's being done that's forward-looking is looking at resilience and looking at how communities, how states, how our country are going to respond in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And that's what this report looks at. And so let me start by just saying that in, uh, in 2007, the state passed the Next Generation Energy Act and set goals for our state for greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, we are going to hit the, 2000, the 2015 uh, mark was hit. Uh, we are not on, uh, on the track for the 2025 mark, nor are we on track for the 2050 mark. And the biggest reasons why we are not going to hit those uh, goals are because of the transportation sector now, just as Chairman Hornstein said. 
energy has rallied up, they have hit their goals, and they have brought their greenhouse gas production down. And I think there's some reasons, and we could talk about that, why that has been successful as a sector for energy, and um, this report lays out some ideas how trans the transportation sector could be successful in bringing down greenhouse gas <coughs> gases. Um, the, uh, the chairman was talking about what has been happening. The 30-year average uh, minimum winter temperature has been going up in Minnesota. And although we could say that maybe that's a good thing, it's really not. Uh, it makes us wetter. And we are having uh, the wettest year that we have had in recorded climate history in Minnesota. And that is uh, why you are seeing scenes like this. In June 2019, this is Trunk Highway 52, uh, just south of uh, Pine Island. We do not advise you to drive through water at MnDOT, so let me just say that. It's not a good idea. Um, and some of the things that this means uh, at MnDOT, uh, how do we respond to these sorts of things as we're planning? We are changing how we do things. We are putting into our asset preservation new modeling about how we will respond and plan our roads because of these temperature changes. Um, we have to plan for different types of pavement responses, both in how we clear the pavement and how the pavement responds, all of these sorts of things. So, it has consequences today to what's happening. When you look at the emissions by economic sector from 2005 to 2016, you can see what's happening here. Um, this is where the decrease in the electric sector has been pretty significant and where other sectors have not been uh, having quite as significant of a decrease. Um, you may wonder, why MnDOT? Why are we doing this? We actually do have statutory authority to study the greenhouse gas reduction, and that is exactly why we undertook this study, and to begin this planning, and to be able to really analyze how would we advise reducing greenhouse gases in the transportation transportation sector. So, um, when you look at surface transportation sector, you're going to see that uh, the, the major surface transportation producers are broken out here. And we look at these in detail in the work that we've done to say, what does it look like going forward? So we gathered together, uh, we led the way on this study, we weren't alone, the EQB worked with us, uh, the PCA worked with us, the Department of Ag worked with us. We coordinated uh, over 50 state and national technical experts on the study, uh, private, nonprofit sectors as well to inform the study. We modeled strategies to be able to reduce uh, the greenhouse gases, and we did public engagement around this because we, we know that to be successful in having any sort of accepted greenhouse gas reduction, the public needs to be behind the recommendations or it will not uh, be able to move forward. So, what did we do uh, here to say modeling out? So we did a baseline study and said if we do nothing and just look at you know a normal acceptance of electric vehicles coming forward, what will happen? And, and what happens is we have a slight reduction of greenhouse gases and then it goes up again. So we actually focused on these two scenarios um, one is uh, one is 80 percent reduction uh, by 2050 and one is hundred percent reduction by 2050 and the focus is really 
uh, on, on these two scenarios in the report. So the pink is the fuel economy standards. And so those are the current federal standards for all vehicles to make them pollute less per miles traveled. And um, that is looking at what you heard the governor announce last week, going through a rulemaking process with the PCA leading the way to have more choice available on the floor of a, um, of a, man, of a dealership, thank you. Uh, so Minnesotans could choose more uh, low emission cars and electric vehicles. Because what's happening today out there is we only have a small number of those vehicles available in Minnesota. The red line is reducing the number of uh, miles traveled. So that is really for dense areas, uh, mainly Minneapolis-St. Paul, Rochester, Duluth, where people can make a different choice. They can choose transit, they can choose something else that they could do. Light blue is uh, where uh, we can switch over to a different fueled vehicle and where electric will be available. Darker blue is a mix of electric vehicles and where buses might be switching over by 2050. Green is where biofuels will be able uh, to be the replacement. And olive is uh, the elimination of heavy uh, refrigerants over time. And so you can see it's a combination effect of things that are really going to be able to get us there. And I'm sure there's a lot that, that everyone will want to talk about in that slide. Um, I'm sure we can't do it all today, but there's going to be a lot of, of things that come out of this discussion for future discussion and hearings. Uh, the public outreach, some of the things that we heard, and the, the longer report has a lot more in it, but the public, Minnesotans told us through this process that there is very strong support for requiring car makers to offer more fuel efficient vehicles here in Minnesota. And that's what this rulemaking process will result in in Minnesota, that funding um, electric vehicle and biofuel infrastructure across the state. So you see the Tesla stations, but the Tesla stations can only fuel Tesla vehicles. So we need something that is more interoperable to have that, uh, so people don't have what is called range anxiety uh, across the state. Funding um, electric vehicle incentives and requiring multimodal options in community design. A little bit um, like the transit director was talking about, one of the things that the transit office at MnDOT has undertaken is this regional approach to transit planning across the state so that communities are more connected. There is more planning going on where the, and this was always amazing to me when I sat on the transportation committee, that the transit stopped at the county boundary. And you know, more, we, need, we may need the transit system to go across the county boundaries. So these are the things that we saw a lot of support for um, as we did the outreach. And then um, uh, what we saw is that there are things that MnDOT can do right now and there are recommendations that were outside of MnDOT's authority and control and where other state agencies can take action or maybe the governor needs to take action. So that's how we look at the report going forward. So actions, finding integrated solutions. So one of the things uh, that we will be doing is having a sustainable transportation advisory council. So you know we have uh, a connected and automated vehicle council that will be reappointed soon that will be focused on connected and automated vehicles. We also want to have a sustainable and transportation advisory council that will be focused on these issues, including the future funding of transportation under a scenario where more electric vehicles and differently fueled vehicles are available. 
regional collaboration on electric vehicle corridors, funding electric vehicle infrastructure, clean transportation funding, providing more transportation options on projects, and providing electric vehicle options. The recommendations, and you certainly can read them all, but um, you know, being able, the governor also recently appointed a biofuels council to work on many of these things. Um, but promoting biofuels to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and supporting rural Minnesota. We, there, we know there's work to be done both in the production of biofuels <laughs> becoming greener uh, and how important it is to rural Minnesota to have uh, clean technology in that area as well. So, I'm not going to read all the conclusions because I know I'm going to run out of time, Mr. Chairman, but maybe I should stop there and if anyone has questions right now. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, questions from the committee? Representative Runbeck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, the 2007 Renewable um, Energy Act or whatever, um, at the time, there were there were all these uh, um, you know calculations about you know how many million tons of CO2 in the air, um, and I, I, I still have to wonder. And now that it's coming up again, I mean, will we as a committee, because we're the ones that should know and understand this, will we have the chance to actually hear from whoever, some kind of an expert that has put these numbers together? Where who comes up with? statewide, you know, this calculation. I mean, it does seem like, I mean, you know, we need to know because uh, if we're going to be changing this kind of policy in our state dramatically, um, it shouldn't be based on just somebody's, you know, con conception, you know. It should be something real. Sure. So, Commissioner. Mr. Chair and Representative Runbeck, um, I am happy when, when if you would like to call another hearing or when you're back in session to bring uh, the experts before you. I mean, basically what we've done here is because the law of the, of the Next Generation Energy Act applies to all, we've applied this to the transportation sector, which we believe it applies to in the law, we have gone out and and modeled what is happening in greenhouse gases in Minnesota. And, and we could bring our experts in who have done that. Mr. Chair, I think that would be very Runbeck. helpful. Yeah, I, I concur, Representative Runbeck, and I think, uh, again, in a future hearing, we, we should, uh, I think, take a look at the modeling mm -hmm. uh, for this and other reports. And, um, and also, you know, if there's some specific numerical goals that we have uh, in terms of how, how to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. Those would be helpful, but I do think Representative Runbeck, that's a good suggestion, and, and we'll, uh, we'll work on that again uh, in the near future, probably if we do it, uh, we don't do it in the interim early in the session. Representative Kosnick. Representative Hausman, then Representative uh, Kosnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just an observation or request, perhaps. I hope we spend at least as much time uh, as we are talking about single occupancy electric vehicles which still need roads and bridges as we do on public mass transit and intercity passenger rail where we're moving masses of people in some corridors that I hope we don't forget that um, efficiency piece so that, that's my one concern about the popular new subject. Thank and you. Representative Hausman, I would agree uh, there was a editorial recently on that I'll share with you and other members of the committee in the San Francisco newspaper actually which talked about this very issue and that you know one of the best and, and you touched on it too commissioner about you know driving less is, is sometimes uh, we overlook that and, and and the role of land use planning in, in reducing carbon emissions uh, the U of M did a study in 2009 and in addition to transit and uh, uh, energy efficient vehicles came up with that as a very important uh, way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transportation. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good to see you again, Commissioner. It's been like a couple times in the last couple of weeks that we've seen each other. Uh, in reference to the electric vehicle, um, slide 12 or so, the, the fund electric vehicle enhancements on the infrastructure was one of the uh, actions that we recommended. Could you share a little bit about um, kind of standardizing charging systems for the um, presumed uh, 
popular, um, the, the presumed uh, electric vehicle uh, that are coming here. And you'd mentioned, you know, Tesla charges on a different system and that. And, um, you know, I guess I would have some concerns uh, from a state perspective of how we're deciding which charging systems to, to do and, um, you know, maybe let the market kind of figure it out first and, and then it'd probably be a more appropriate discussion to, for state investments, if, if, if any at all. Good question. So, Thank you, yeah, Commissioner. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Representative Kazik, I think it's a great question. And actually, Department of Commerce and the PCA have been doing some work on this with the Volkswagen settlement. So I think this is where we need to do some cross-sector work because it's not only the Department of Transportation uh, working on this issue, and it's why we have been trying to work um, uh, across with our other agencies on the issues of planning and, oh, <laughs> and not, not only thinking about, um, not just choosing, but I, I think I use it as an example with Tesla because Tesla has made a huge investment in their technology, but it's proprietary technology. And it's built right into the price of that vehicle. When you buy that vehicle, you have, uh, you have a, a guarantee that you're going to be able to fuel that vehicle as you travel across the country. Uh, the challenge is, if you uh, buy a Chevy Bolt right now, you may not have that same guarantee to be able to make it across the country in the same sort of way. And so I think it is a question. Is it our job to do that, or is it someone else's job to do that? We need to have that discussion. It's a great discussion for policymakers to be having right now. Thank you. I appreciate the comments. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. I very much I concur with your line of questioning here. So we'll take one more question yeah. from Representative Elkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, another question I've been exploring, and I hope we can get an answer to, is that we, ha we had a, I was one of several people who had a, t a tour with uh, Excel Energy recently. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, a question that I, I posed to them, and they, they couldn't uh, answer on the spot, but they said that they could derive that answer, is that, uh, the question of uh, what percentage of the energy that you're using to charge your electric vehicle is actually clean energy as well. And the, the, the rough answer I got was that if you're charging your car in the small hours of the night, evening, um, the vast majority of the energy that's being used to charge your car is either uh, nuclear or wind, which is to say uh, CO2 free. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did promise me that they would be able to quantify it. They said it does vary somewhat by season, but I think that's a, a big part of the answer as well. So, Mr. Chair and Representative Elkins, it's actually why I think, um, when I came to the department, one of the things I wanted to separate out is the, the Connect and Automated Vehicle Task Force from the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. Because I think that people sometimes get a little confused mm -hmm. between Connect and Automated Vehicles. Connect and Automated Vehicles can have a combustion engine. No, no doubt about it. Some of you are driving level two and level three connected vehicles today. But uh, an electric vehicle, if you're driving one, is very different in terms of it may have a connected uh, a feature to it. But we can answer some of those questions in that, in that advisory council or task force. And so uh, we're going to get that formed up here. And that is some of those key questions that we can then start producing reports on and get to the bottom of. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, so much, and we look forward to our continued work with you. Well, and, and thank you. And I, I'm, I'm just happy to have gotten to come to Winona and see some of these great projects out here. And, and uh, I always think it's really beneficial when we can <coughs> see things around this. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. We appreciated your uh, joining us for part of the tour this Thanks. morning as well. So, members, we're going to have um, one final uh, presentation from a state agency, and we're very happy to have the Commissioner of Public Safety with us, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, so it's been a very busy summer uh, as it relates to, to the Department of Public Safety. So as the members know, um, uh, we have uh, oversight over this department, uh, particularly in its transportation functions. Uh, 
uh, the state patrol uh, is, is part of our oversight uh, responsibilities, also driver and vehicle services. And so there are a couple of issues that um, we have been very attentive to in this committee on a bipartisan basis, and I want to thank again Representative Torkelson for his uh, efforts on uh, the li uh, vehicle license uh, registration system, our new system that we've transitioned to. Um, and uh, we also, so we're going to hear about that. There's been an update. We're making a transition from the old Minlar system to the new VTRS system. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. I'll get in trouble. Um, and uh, uh, so we're going to hear about that. A, a contract was signed with uh, FAST systems, so we'll hear about that. Uh, also, um, uh, I asked the department to uh, give us a response. Uh, we've had, again, I've had members from both sides of the aisle uh, contact me in recent months. This has been an ongoing issue with uh, uh, families who are trying to get uh, driver's exams uh, for their uh, kids. Uh, some in the Twin Cities have talked to me about traveling as far as Albert Lee to get this, and uh, we wanted to find out uh, from the department uh, 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 any response they have to that problem and, and how they're s working to solve that. And then finally, uh, I, it caught my attention the Winona Daily News uh, had an article again about uh, these uh, extreme weather events and I, I learned in this article from just a couple weeks ago and uh, from the Daily News that um, the Department of Public Safety through the Homeland HSEM uh, uh, was involved in the disaster response here in terms of getting money out to the communities <laughs> And I wanted the department to uh, discuss a little how that process is going and how that works uh, when there is a natural disaster of this kind and, and Homeland Security and Emergency Management uh, is involved. Uh, we had, I think, a question about that earlier today, how that money gets to local communities. So those are the three items uh, we, we have on the agenda for, for you, Commissioner Harrington. And again, appreciate so much that, that you've come uh, uh, from the, the Twin Cities down here to be with us and, and answer questions and give a presentation. So, welcome back to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Harrington. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, and it has, was a beautiful drive down, and uh, as per my governor's orders, that when he talks about one Minnesota, he means that we, as his commissioners, will see all of Minnesota. And I think I'm on 36 counties currently uh, and working toward the whole 87 before we're done. So, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, starting in January of 2019, the Department of Public Safety had really three priorities for our driver and vehicle services. Number one, fix minlars. Uh, and for most of the first part of the session, that was, uh, it was minlars in the morning, it was minlars in the afternoon, occasionally it was minlars late into the night, but it was minlars constantly. Uh, our second priority was preparing for Real ID, uh, which uh, if you haven't seen the commercials, you will. October of 2020, you have to have your real ID if you want to fly. Uh, and then the third we had uh, was to address what we saw as a coming backlog for driver's license testing. Uh, the deputy registers, uh, the community, the legislature, uh, and the governor's office made it very, very clear to me at, from the very earliest top five that uh, fixing men large was the number one priority. And so, starting in January, we began working on deficiency funding. We got the deficiency funding. We were able to hire some uh, temporary staff uh, so that we could start working on the backlog because there were literally uh, cases stacked above desk level, above cubicle level, that were old titles that were in the paper form that we were trying to get caught up. Uh, that backlog was literally months long, and we have. Uh, through some judicious use of part-time staff and new staff and some new technology, uh, really pretty much caught that up. Uh, we work with Minute to prepare for uh, two releases. Uh, number one, fix the uh, specialty plate issue. Um, Fairbolt 1 comes flashing into mind uh, whenever I think about uh, specialty plates. Um, uh, but there were literally hundreds of other deficiencies that the DRs had that they said needed to be fixed, and so between release one and two, we've managed to fix most of those. We have worked with the DRs and the auto dealers, uh, and because we were granted that funding, by May, we were actually able to hire some jumps, and we were actually starting to work on the backlog. Uh, hiring the temps has been a challenge, I will admit to that. That is part of our, part of our, our struggle here. Um, so we hired temps to work on the backlog, 
Uh, so you train the temps, which took the really experienced people off of the line. They trained the temps. The temps got just about good enough, and then about that time, you would move the experienced people back into working on the really thorny issues in there. And then we'd have a new system that needed to come online. And one of the lessons we learned from the 2017 launch is that if you do not do regression testing, you will fail. So we pull the really experienced people off of the line, send them back now down to make sure that we're doing regression testing so that when the system does actually get launched, it doesn't have any failures. And we have had every launch and every release has been perfect because of that. Uh, that has put a strain on our ability to keep up with some of the, some of the work, but we, I think, are keeping moving with that. At the same time, we're also working with, the, with FAST on getting phase two of the DL system up and running. Uh, so Phase one started uh, in the fall of 18, and so what we recognized is that if we didn't get phase two done in a timely fashion, we wouldn't be ready for a window of opportunity. Part of having real ID is having a, being part of a compact where you can check driver's license from state to state to make sure that someone that has a driver's license in Arizona doesn't also have a driver's license in Minnesota. Uh, and there's a window of time when we were allotted to be uh, to be able to get into the state-to-state -state system to look at that. And if we did not have our computer system up and running by July of this year, we would have missed that window. And so we worked with FAST, once again, moving bodies around to make sure that we were ready for July, and we were ready by July. In August, we started our state-to-state -state work. By September, we are largely, I can call that a success, and we're ready for real ID. Uh, this was funded, as I said, by July, we were pretty much done with that. Um, once Menlar's deficiency funding was done and we got those first two fixes, uh, the, we were pivoted. So initially it was just fix the real ID, fix the specialty place, and then it was, well now we really need to do something really substantial about Menlar's. So uh, the conversation led by Rick King and the Blue Ribbon Panel, legislature, the governor's office, and my staff all said, well, what would the recommendation be? The recommendation was to drop Menlar's and pivot to a third party option, which um, some call it meters. Uh, I've heard many of the deputy register refer to that as a curable disease, and so we're, uh, <laughs> at this point, uh, we're looking for our, our, the next great name for this system. Uh, and if any of you have suggestions, we are open to um, those, that conversation. So, uh, Bass has. We began the process with the Department of Admin to do the RFP, got the RFP started, got our first responsive uh, vendor, did the background that needed to be done on that, negotiated a contract that actually came in a little lower than we thought it was going to come in, um, and that was awarded the contract. Um, the timeline that the legislature had given us was we were supposed to have that done by July, and we had it done by July. Uh, something I was told by many very experienced state hands that this was not something, negotiating a $30 million contract for this big a system uh, was not supposed to be able to be done in that time frame, but I've got great staff that doesn't really understand that you can't get stuff done. So thanks to all of that work and Rick King, uh, we have our contract in place, uh, and because we were prepared for this, by the time that contract was signed, we had offices ready for the fast people, we had computers, we had, we were ready for them and fast had people on the ground in July. Uh, in fact, they are so well advanced at this point that we went to the deputy register's annual convention in St. Cloud, they were able to show a demo of what the new beaters, whatever that name is going to be, system will look like and we got a great reaction from the deputy registers that this system was scanning and a much more robust uh, system that they are part and parcel of building is exactly what they were looking for and what they were hoping for, and the training plan is ready to go. Uh, so, Veters and Minlars, Minlars is now being decommissioned, uh, Veters is still being developed, we have a timeline for that, all of those things seem to be working uh, pretty well as we went along there. The next piece of this really then was to go back and look at that whole issue. I said that we had three issues. Real ID was ready to go, Menlars and Peters were ready to go, and then it was the driver's license piece that we started looking at. Um, part of that solution was bringing on some fresh eyes to see that. Uh, we brought on Assistant Commissioner Tim Lino, who had been my business manager uh, when I was at Metro uh, Transit. 
Uh, and we also brought in Emma Corey, who now runs the Department of Vehicle Services. We wanted a fresh set of eyes as to not just titles and reg and licensing, but the whole, the whole product. Because of that, we've come up with three fixes for driver's license. And we actually went back and did our, did our own historical data dump for it. Uh, first thing we noted in that is that there is a peak, there's a surge of when driver's license applications lag the most. And I don't think I would be a great surprise to anybody in this room, that's during the summer. It starts in May. We go from about 20 days out to get a driver's license test in April. By May, it's 50 days. By June, it's 60 days. In July, it's 55 days. And then as we get to the state fair, it drops back down to about 25 days, and then it begins to go back to a normalized level of about 20 days from that point on. Uh, that was that matched the anecdotal stories we'd had from uh, people that had called us. Uh, we got the same calls probably, maybe some of the same people called, that said, uh, my son or daughter or child wanted to take the driver's test, and so in, in May we started to look for a driver's test, and we were told that, well, we could probably get one in late August if we went to Duluth or Albert Lee. Duluth is actually, uh, I think, more popular even than Albert Lee was in terms of being able to get uh, people tested. Uh, that didn't make any sense. Uh, and so we began looking at, well, why, does, why do we have this backlog? And there were a couple of different areas that we felt that, number one, we could start to fix. Uh, the first area was a technological fix. Uh, quite simply, we had a very cumbersome system for trying to find where you could get the test. And so we had Minute work with us to say, could you build us a button that says, find the next available test? Rather than you having to go from the Albert Lee station to the Duluth station to the Apple Valley station to the, you know, to the, and go each station individually looking for a test, just push the button and find the, the next available test. Uh, it doesn't actually speed up the testing process, but it does make the people that are trying to find the test feel a little bit better about the fact that they're not spending hours at a computer trying to negotiate a state system to find a test. Uh, but the second piece actually has really already reduced the backlog. The second part of this, it once again, came out of some anecdotal conversations. Uh, so you want to have your son or daughter take the test. You, you, you're relatively comfortable that they're going to be good at this, but you want to have a plan B. So, what do you do? You sign up for the test at Arden Hills for a date certain, and then you sign up for a test at Albert Lee, and in Winona, and Duluth as a backup plan, because just in case they fail the test, do you really want to wait 60 days from when they fail the test to get the next bite of the apple? The system we had set up allowed you to do that. You could, you could sign up for as many spots as you wanted, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But it also did not eliminate those spots if you pass the test. So what we've now done is we have reworked the system so that you take the test in, you know, in Albert Lee. You pass the test on the first time. The system then goes through and automatically deletes all of the other tests that you had signed up for. Now that might not sound like a lot, but the first time we ran that program, it eliminated 300 tests that would have been a no-show. We estimate that this will save, will free up 26,000 road tests over the course of a year. So that should help us reduce that backlog substantially. It won't necessarily reduce the backlog in the summer, but overall it should cut down the backlog because quite literally in talking to the folks um, at the testing stations, they, are, they have a list of 40 people that show up on a day that are walk-ins. They have all the list of people that are supposedly signed up, and when there's a ton of those people that are no-shows, only a fraction of the people that waited all day. I, the last person I talked to said they got there at 5 o'clock in the morning, and they were number 35 on the list. They spent the day there, and that doesn't make any sense. Nor does the idea that when another person that called me said, well, they could get the test, but it was no loop during school on a work day. So their kid would miss a day of school, they would miss a day of work to get to the loop to do the test. That doesn't make good sense. That's not good customer service. So in order to remedy that, we've come up with two other solutions. Uh, one that is going to go into effect in November, the other will go into effect next summer. The November <coughs> fix is quickly simply this. Um, if you're going to be responsive to the community you serve, which is kind of the model that I've lived by as a cop, 
What hours would you be open for testing? Early evening, weekend. You'd be open in the evening, and we close at 4.30 most days. That doesn't really make much sense. So starting November 1st, we're going to keep driver's license testing stations open until 7. So that when you get out of school at 3, there's now a three and a half hour block. It will, it will give us an additional 18 hours a week because we're also going to be open consistently on Saturdays. That will free up 18 hours per week per station for additional tests. And we think that will help uh, in addition to eliminating the 26,000 no-shows, that will also allow us to make sure that we're more responsive on our testing. The third piece of this is, is a, a pilot that we, will, that we plan to run next summer. So once again, the data shows us the majority of the backlog is during the summer. I've got staff that wants to take the summer off like everybody else does. Um, but I, that's when I've got the backlog, so I, they can't take the summer off. And I don't have enough people to fill all of the spots that I have. Who else has got the summer off, though? College kids. College kids and? Teachers. teachers. And teachers. If we recruited a seasonal and created a seasonal driver's testing set that could be hired from those two populations, we could fill all of our work during the summer, and in fact, fill more work than we needed, allowing our regular staff to take some time off during the summer, but not negatively impacting any of the folks that want to have tests. We believe that that will be up and running and ready by the summer of 2020. Uh, and so between those three and remedies, we believe that we will have a much better story to tell you next summer uh, when we come back to talk about where is the backlog and where is our, our where are we at on that. Uh, I will note that I think we have had some successes. Uh, I look back at when I first got here. The lag time for titles when I first got here was 81 days. The time now average for titles is 26 days. Um, driver's licenses are all coming out between 37 and 40 days, and we expect, and actually it is our goal that we stated, is to have all driver's license out in people's hands in, in, 20 day, in 30 days or less, and we believe we can get that to substantially less than that. Uh, the last item that you asked me to, to talk about uh, was, in fact, the, uh, the disaster recovery. Uh, and once again, it's the story of two different seasons. When I got to the legislature, I got to, to this office, uh, it was snow and we were rescuing people from uh, highways all over the place. And then we were having power lines that were dropping because of ice. Um, and then that water melted and became bigger water and now the rain doesn't ever want to seem to stop uh, and so we have continued to have more and more disasters there. Let me try to get my numbers right. So since April We've had 13 major disasters. Uh, there have been three presidential federal disasters. Presidential disasters are different than the state disasters in that the federal government pays for 75% of the disaster and the state has to come up with the other 25%. With state disasters, we pay the, we pay the entire amount. Um, there have been 10 internal <coughs> disasters declared. We've responded to and designated state or federal disaster aid to 118 different local municipalities. Uh, and eight tribal nations since uh, in this, this calendar year. Uh, the total damage to public infrastructure from all of those disasters, most of which are water related, has been $90 million. Uh, the federal government is on the hook for the majority of that, um, but we have still about $30 million that we believe will be uh, let out from state funds to county and townships uh, these are primarily uh, related to roads, and from what we've been told by the local emergency managers, uh, it is roads and bridges that have taken the biggest beating. Uh, although we've also heard from them that says uh, the water systems, the sewage systems, were never designed for this volume of water, and so they are operating beyond peak capacity. As I said, bridges and roads are the single largest category of damage from the natural disasters. Um, and we are told that by several experts that they have never seen uh, the infrastructure that is supposed to handle the water in worse condition. Uh, and Monia Lowe's folks we talked to have been doing this for 30 years. 
Uh, we have a number of key multi-agency uh, partnerships. Um, many of them are really starting to talk about mitigation as much as we're talking about disaster uh, response. So there's the rebuilding of it, but there's also the issue of how do we build so that the next time it floods, we don't have as big a disaster. Um, and what we're seeing from that is that while there are increasing federal dollars to support mitigation, the state doesn't normally provide the match, and that means that local municipalities then have to, or the counties have to provide that 25% match. And that is uh, a challenge that most of them are saying they cannot match that dollar for dollar. <coughs> and so they look to the state for relief, and the dollars that we got through deficiency and through our regular legislative process, which are for the response to these major disasters, are frankly uh, tied up. And the Department of Public Safety out of HSEM does not have the funds currently to be able to support these mitigation efforts. And so um, we are having that conversation with our local partners to say, we are going to have to work with you to try and find other resources to do the mitigation because if we don't do the mitigation, what we know will happen is the same tragedies that have happened this time will happen again uh, because the, the flooding is not stopping and it is the water continues to come. Uh, that, in, in, in short, is, uh, is my uh, response to thank the questions you. that you asked. Yes, thank you. Over time, I no, apologize. No, for no, that. That we, we had a, a big assignment for you. So, I, again, appreciate your uh, testimony and appreciate what a wonderful partner you've been. Uh, to this committee and, and your tenure so far as commissioner. So, uh, members, I just wanted to just, uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, I want those to be brief and the answers to be brief because uh, we have two bills we want to hear and we want to get the public testimony and end on time. And uh, Representative Hausman does have a time constraint because she has another committee to go to. So I'm going to ask Representative Nelson for, to keep his question brief and Representative Elkins to keep his question brief and, and the responses and then we'll move, be able to move on in our agenda. Uh, Representative Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and Commissioner. And, and Representative Cosner. Um, the, the question I had, and you, you touched on some of that as you were going on with the uh, driver's license and vehicle, um, the face of the driver's license testing is the increasing capacity. It seems like, have, are we tracking where that is, and it doesn't make sense to find a way to build another or create another testing area, even a temporary one during the summer that can help take some of that capacity? In my mind, it doesn't seem like we have any more tests when I took my test 50 years ago, or my sons took their test 30 years ago, and some of those same places are there, I think the population in our state has increased dramatically since that time. And I guess I said, you touched on some of that, creating a way to increase the capacity by adding staff, temporary staff during the summer, and, and slightly in the hours. But if we looked at that as a way of possibly finding a map to get on where the, where the biggest backlog is, and finding a way to increase the capacity by maybe adding another testing site. Commissioner Harrington. Mr. Chair, Representative Nelson, the answer is yes. Uh, we've looked in, in a variety of places. Part of this is looking at where the demographics uh, are telling us we have a lot, large cohorts of uh, young people that are driving so that we can, in fact, place uh, driver's license testing stations there. One of the places we've looked at, for example, is in North Minneapolis. There is a large cohort of young people uh, from a wide variety, and there does there is no real close testing center there. Um, in this case, it would probably mean we would have them doing the road test on, on city streets. Uh, as many of us did, that's how I took my test on the south side of Chicago, uh, it was probably maybe a little more challenging back in those days. So yes, we are looking at that, but we also recognize that we have facilities that are under utilized. We have facilities that are only operating during the morning, and so frankly getting enough staff to operate them for their full complement. We've already built the infrastructure. I think we should try and make sure we use that infrastructure first before we build anything substantially new. Thank you. Representative Elkins. <coughs> Real quick. Um, anecdotally, um, I, we have colleagues who um, have been, gotten their real ID in like two weeks uh, who have a top secret security clearances and other colleagues who have waited two months who don't have top secret security clearances. Do we know how much of the delay is in the handoff from, you know, DVS takes all of the information and it has to be shipped off to Washington, D.C. for the federal background checks and, come, and, and then comes back? Do we know how much of the delay is the feds doing their thing as opposed to anything that you have under your control? 
Commissioner Harrington. Okay. I don't think this is the, like, I'm not going to blame the federal government yeah. on this. What I think is more likely to have happened is as I move staff from driver's license to titles or move them to regression testing, the number of staff that we're processing has come and gone. And, and we see we see our rise and fall more related to our staffing of okay. the centers than we think it has anything to do with the background checks in terms of getting that contact with the feds. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Kosnick, for our last question. Thank you, and I, I will try not to ask a question during the other bills, um, but I do think this is a very important, extremely important Absolutely. Um, topic, so I appreciate the time of the committee. Um, Commissioner, thanks for being here. I, I didn't know that you were going to be uh, speaking on the driver's exams things. This is an issue that uh, I've heard about in, in my community with a lot of young families, uh, growing high schools, um, so it's uh, been very forefront of some of the work that I've been doing this summer. Um, I think your um, suggestion or, or in November extending the hours is incredibly uh, customer service orientated and I think the public will appreciate that. So thank you for um, doing something that's just maybe more common sense. Um, and so I think that's a, you know, some of the things that you mentioned in the, in the summer hours and stuff, uh, I think is very helpful. Uh, you know, a lot of the places that I talk to have labor shortages. so. Uh, your suggestion of trying to have teachers, uh, I think it's it's outside the box. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, teachers want to kind of do that, but it, it's a good attempt, so um, good luck on that one. But I, I was hoping that you could comment um, that w uh, on two things. One was um, it, my understanding is that the current law is that you should be able to schedule a driver's exam uh, test within 14 days either in your county of residence or the neighboring county, if I understood it correctly. I, I'm not sure if you're um, uh, prepared to comment on that, but if you are, I, I'd, I'd be curious. And, and there's you know, some ramifications that that's the standard that was set previously that, that we should be trying to meet. Um, and then further, um, you know, in doing some of the work that I've, I've looked at into this issue, um, could, if you'd be able to comment today uh, about certain driving schools have standing uh, test times reserved for them uh, at these training centers. And so if you are a, a mom or a dad uh, trying to take your uh, son or daughter to get tested, uh, the, the driving test done, uh, you have to kind of know the system and, and be willing to pay maybe a little bit more in many cases, an extra 100 bucks or something to these, these uh, certain schools to kind of jump in front of the line. Uh, if you could comment on, on that, if you think that's a, a practice that should continue, if that's something we should do away with. Um, and then uh, the whole practice of having certain preferred schools have that ability and other schools don't and, and how they get on that, that preferred list. Um, I'm concerned that there, are, there may be schools that are charging extra to have these predetermined times that they've been given for free on a preferred status that they're marking up uh, a state resource uh, and, and profiting off that. I think that's something that um, I'd like to hear your comments and something that I'd like to work on going into next session. Commissioner Harrington. Uh, I've heard the 14-day rule more as a guideline than it has been a state law, and so I'm going to have to do some more checking on that to be able to give you, get you a, 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 a much more satisfactory We'll have Mr. Burris that. look into that as okay. well. Uh, on the second piece, <laughs> Not yes, right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, on your second question about the driver's license schools or the driving driver training schools, we have seen that. Uh, we've had conversations. We are preparing at this point to have a conversation with that industry or that group, that group of schools to say, we believe that that does not make sense to us, that everyone should have a fair and equal chance of getting a driver's test. And so we are prepared to have that conversation with them. We expect there will be some pushback from other uh, schools that have had a uh, preferred situation where they got the first pick of um, for those driving testing dates, uh, but we believe that a more equitable system needs to be worked out, and we would welcome your input and suggestions as to how we get to that equitable piece, because it does appear that not only are parents cut out, but even some of the other driving schools have called us to say that they are also cut out of uh, being able to get any spots. And Representative Kozak, if you have one quick follow-up, and then I have a suggestion, then we'll move on to Representative Hausman's bill. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the comments. Uh, sitting next the 
the uh, privilege of sitting next to the house research is that <laughs> yeah, he can whisper yeah, in your ear. Yeah. Apparently the 14 day is uh, in statute and so that's something that uh, we'll obviously need to uh, work together on to um, meet that. Um, and then I appreciate the, the commissioner's comments today and being prepared to discuss this and uh, we'll do some work uh, and I, I look forward to working with you. I look forward to working with you on both of those and, then thank I, you. and thank you and, and, and Representative Constant, and, thanks. And Lakeville would be a great site for yeah. uh, an additional yeah. testing uh, site. I, I can okay. work with you on I that too. I see a bill coming. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Representative. Back there taking copious notes so. But and, and thank you for your, your thoughtful responses and, and clearly there is more work to do. And, and I guess what I would propose, you know, and Representative Kosnick, uh, you, you've raised questions that, again, um, you know, people are calling me uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisles I mentioned. And, you know, maybe we might want to convene or I would be happy to convene some of, sort of an informal uh, working group before session uh, for us to, to bat around some ideas, you know, along with uh, the department and others, others, you know, clearly the parents. I think we want to engage with the parents who've been calling us uh, and, and figure out, uh, you know, a way to, to address this question in, in the next session. Because it's important, it's urgent, I think we're making progress, but, you know, maybe we should have a little, you know, conversation about that. So, thank you, uh, members, and thank you, Commissioner Harrington. and. Um, and now we'll transition to uh, a couple of bills that we're going to hear. Um, so for those uh, members of the public, um, what, what you'll see now, we're not going to vote on these bills, um, but we are going to have a hearing as we would in St. Paul, what we would call an informational hearing. Uh, and so a couple members of the committee uh, have bills that I think are of very specific interest to uh, this part of the state, uh, as well as statewide import. And um, uh, the first bill uh, we're going to hear, and so what we do is we ha uh, typically have the member uh, briefly present the bill to the committee, and then um, uh, the committee has a chance to interact with uh, uh, the author with some questions, and then we have uh, witnesses, members of the public, uh, or, or those that have an interest in the bill uh, speak for or against the legislation, and then we'll, we move on. So. Uh, the first, uh, we're going to have, the, each member has two related bills. Representative Torkelson will be next after Representative Hausman. Uh, but we'll, f we'll first hear uh, Representative Hausman's uh, House File 1804, and I guess 1493 is similar. Um, and uh, the members have the choice of either presenting the bill where they're sitting, or they can go to the testifier's table, and Representative Hausman, as a member of the committee, has uh, opted to just stay where she is. And... Uh, uh, Representative Hausman, um, uh, I will move uh, House Files well, 18. We, we we're, we're not moving, we're not moving them, not, not even for uh, to lay them over. Okay. So this is just for information uh, purposes only, uh, and we will hear again House Files 1804 and 1493 that were both uh, introduced uh, last February. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and there's a reason I'm staying here, because normally, if I were presenting a bill, I would be speaking to members, hoping to engage them in the bill and, and get them to support my bill. Today, because we're here, the far more important conversation that we're having is our speaking to the community about this, and in this case, because I know uh, the bills I'm presenting, there is huge local support for it, and so I'm going to speak very little because we have good testifiers uh, from the communities that, that we're visiting uh, who will speak to their support of this and, and why. Uh, so really, in these two bills, there are, there are three ideas. Uh, in one bill, we just uh, fund the uh, second train to Chicago. Uh, today, we got a very um, good example of what one problem we'd solve if we did that. Um, we visited the depot, and the passengers were sitting there waiting. I don't know how long they had been waiting, and they still had to wait longer because the Empire Builder would be coming from the West Coast uh, where there has been a lot of snow in Montana and Wyoming. And so there is, a, uh, there is given that long trip and uh, weather uh, delays, they were waiting. <laughs> if there were a second train a day that just went from the Twin Cities to Chicago, um, they wouldn't be affected by that. And interestingly, as we were having the presentation and Derek James uh, from Amtrak was, was talking about this, um, one of the couples came up to me after that was waiting, and I mean, they were just quite intrigued by this because clearly they make this trip from uh, the Twin Cities, or from Winona to Chicago uh, with some frequency, 
And it suddenly occurred to them, this would be a really good deal. Uh, and so uh, local, I know we have some local uh, people who will speak to the strong support about this second train to Chicago and its important, importance. In the other bill, uh, we do two things. Uh, one, we fund, um, we provide funding for the department to move forward on the entire state rail plan. There is a state rail plan that's developed, that's been developed by MnDOT. A good bit of work has gone into this. This would fund a variety of corridors uh, that are all at different stages. Um, the Northern Lights Express between the Twin Cities and Duluth. Um, additional Amtrak service from um, the uh, Twin Cities to Chicago. And then, uh, Representative Walcomot, uh, the extension of North Star commuter rail to St. Cloud. A long time ago, we started that corridor. And um, Representative Walcomot was successful this year in getting some cash to continue the study. That has been driven by local support. Their mayor, their chamber of commerce, the, uh, the city all understood the importance of getting that extension to North Star. Uh, uh, to St. Cloud, and he was successful. He was successful because of local support, and that's why I'm delighted that we're here today and that Red Wing and, and Winona will speak to us about similar uh, local support. I think Northfield is also in the room today. At least I heard that some people might be uh, representing Susie, couldn't, who couldn't be here. Um, there's a part of that second bill uh, where we provide um, 500000 from the general fund for study and alternatives from rail service. Uh, uh, the, the ones that have been driving that have been primarily Northfield, uh, but I know all aboard Minnesota believes uh, that a train to the south has some real promise. Um, for those of you in Northfield, I would invite you to contact newly elected Jeff Brand from St. Peter because I just spoke to him last night, and he has a good bit of interest in connecting uh, his part of uh, southern Minnesota as well. So um, I do uh, believe that just as uh, Representative Wolgamot uh, rec recognized that local support is essential, Red Wing and, and um, Winona will provide that today. And uh, I, I'm not sure if Northfield is, is speaking, but um, at any rate, there's, I think there's reason to hope that, that, that there will be um, additional um, support there. Um, All Aboard Minnesota has done an economic study of the importance of pass intercity passenger rail to their state and their region. Um, I'm not comparing us to California or New York. I'm, I'm comparing us to the Midwestern states like Texas and Kansas, all of whom are understanding the economic impact of intercity passenger rail to their area. They are all happily accepting federal money and federal partnerships uh, to do that. Um, in this case, believe it or not, Minnesota is, is trailing everybody. You know, people are passing us by. Um, all of our Midwest economic competitors. And so this is, uh, I've been carrying these bills for a few years. Uh, I am hoping uh, that local support from this region will light a fire as you contact the governor, as you contact your local legislators uh, to, uh, to bring this um, message to bear. And I think, Mr. Chair, I won't say much more than that right now just because I know we have good testimony and maybe we'll wrap up after. Sure. Uh, well, thank you. Are there any questions from members of the committee to uh, Chair Hausman? Okay. Well, with that, I do have some people that called us ahead of time uh, to testify. Uh, first will be uh, Mr. Paul Schulmeyer. He's a member of the Winona City Council. He's also a member of the Great River Rail Commission. And I want to also thank Council Member uh, Schulmeyer also for joining us this morning at the depot. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record. Good afternoon. Paul Schulmeyer. I'm a resident here of Winona, and I'm a council member here for the city, and I am on the Great River Rail Commission. I have, a, I have a written statement, and I'll read through that. I want to provide time for uh, my constituents speak here today. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, like I said earlier, my name is Paul Schulmeyer. I am on the City Council here in Winona and on the Great River Rail Commission. Uh, we will be meeting on November 7th in Red Wing at the County Office Building. You are very welcome to attend. I want to extend my warm and dry welcome 
uh, to uh, you all, to our community. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about issues related to transportation in our great city. I'll be brief. I'll allow time for other constituents to speak. <coughs> there are numerous issues uh, which rise to the level of concern for my constituents. Among them, EV infrastructure, regional workforce, transportation, bicycle safe routes, roads and bridges, alternative transportation, especially the inner city passenger rail service. But my focus here today will be rail transportation and specifically uh, funding for the final design, administration, and construction of the Minnesota part of the Twin City, Chicago, Milwaukee, also known as the TCMC, or more simply, the second train. Currently, Winona, St. Paul, and Red Wing are the only active rail stations in the state that receive daily passenger rail. That hasn't deterred 123,000 passengers riding the current Empire Builder, nor the 41% of Winona State University students who said they have used Amtrak in the past, 41% of 7,000 students. Unfortunately, in Minnesota, they only get a single eastbound and westbound train each day. One option daily. Oftentimes, the eastbound train is delayed, as Representative Houseman mentioned earlier. This is far too little passenger rail for a state that leads the Midwest in so many aspects of business and tourism. Fortunately, a plan is in the works that would bring a second train to these communities, adding 155,000 passenger trips annually between Chicago and St. Paul, 70% of which, I have heard, do not get off in St. Paul or Chicago, but disembark in rural communities such as Winona. Without the intended uh, unintended delays from weather and crowded rail lines in the Dakotas or Montanas or Montana. A second train would create jobs and generate economic growth in our community as some of Amtrak's contractors are right here in this city. A second train would decrease the amount of automobile traffic on highly subsidized interstate highways. A second train would provide a safe, reliable, relaxing, productive, and affordable alternative to driving or flying. It would also add al alternatives for a lar large college population while simultaneously reducing issues related to student automobile parking right here <coughs> in our city. A second train would conveni conveniently arrive at four to six hour differential from the current Empire Builder, creating arrival and departures in Minnesota that better fit a business traveler's schedule. It would provide access to tourism, outdoor recreation, <coughs> and to our ever-expanding cultural arts calendar, a more than $100 million economic impact in our community. Finally, improvements to siding in Minnesota and Wisconsin will enhance the flow of freight rail within the corridor, a resource important to all of Minnesotans. To make the second train possible, improvements are needed along the rail corridor in Minnesota, specifically at the Mississippi River crossing near La Crescent, at the CK Tower siding in Winona, and as previously mentioned, and as you toured earlier, the platform in Winona. Mr. Chairman, earlier this year, the Winona City Council unanimously passed a resolution supporting the TCMC, unanimously. Without reservations, we ask that your committee and the Minnesota House adopt and pass the MnDOT request for $10 million in matching funds to a future federal grant for the final design and construction of track, signal, and siding improvements in Minnesota. The city of Winona and 155,000 future passengers are eager, eager for your support, as are the other river communities that stand ready to welcome them.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Council Member Schulmeyer. Um, any members have questions of the council member? Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, Representative uh, Runbeck, sure. Chair. Sorry about that, Ms. <clears throat> Representative Runbeck. So, uh, so, Mr. Schulmeyer, I think this morning we were told that the cost is something like 31 million total for the upgrades that you're looking at. Is that, that not the no I believe that's correct. Okay. It, it's so approximately in Minnesota uh, about 31 million. Correct. Um, and is that the extent of what you're looking at, or will is that just the first piece of a rollout that's going to continue? So uh, that's a very detailed question. To, to the best of my understanding, that $31 million, and there are uh, MnDOT officials here that could correct me, to the best of my understanding, that $31 million would pay for um, uh, the construction of the side rails at the river crossing, the platform in Winona, and the side rail at, at the tower crossing. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, it does seem like that in reading the information here that there is perhaps more, more expansion that would, would occur after this. So I'm just curious about that. And does, does Winona have a sense of what dollars they might be involved in providing? Is there any sort of real number you're looking at? I have no dollar figures that the city would be uh, pitching in uh, as far as contributions for this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Rumbeck. And again, thank you, Council Member. Um, our next uh, testifier uh, is Sean Dows, the mayor of Red Wing and also a member of the uh, Great River Rail Commission. If I didn't pronounce your last name correctly, I apologize. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Sean Douse, and I'm oh. proud to be uh, uh, the mayor of Red Wing, Minnesota. And it's great to be here. I appreciate you coming down and this opportunity to uh, testify for you. I'm here to support uh, Representative Housman's bill, uh, also the uh, 10 million, uh, 10 million uh, uh, for the top, uh, Twin City, <coughs> uh, Milwaukee, Chicago second train. Uh, at present. Uh, mostly sold out trains arrive uh, in Red Wing twice a day. And folks uh, can embark uh, on trips both east and west uh, and points east and west uh, throughout the country. And visitors can disembark uh, in Red Wing and uh, travel just one block uh, from the station to our historic downtown and uh, hotel and entertainment district. Tourism is a several million dollar industry in Red Wing as part of our economy. We attract visitors from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and all over the country. The increased in impact trip, uh, trips that would be provided by the second train would provide a safe, reliable travel alternative to Red Wing and our region, and a more convenient schedule of round trips as, as uh, Mr. Schulmeyer talked about. And I, I really believe that would foster day trips to and from uh, Red Wing, from points north and south, as well <coughs> as become uh, encouraged trips for work uh, in Red Wing, uh, going to the Twin Cities and points south. Uh, you have before you, uh, I think, a resolution that the City Council passed as Mr. Schulmeyer has uh, unanimously, uh, they noting that uh, the TCMC will offer faster and more reliable travel times and will provide a more attractive and affordable transportation option. Uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation has already led a study to evaluate service schedules and develop a conceptual engineering and cost estimates, uh, estimates for, to track, for track and signal uh, improvements in Minnesota and Wisconsin to accommodate the second uh, passenger train. The work was done in 2018 with funding from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, Ramsey County, and the La Crosse Area Planning Committee. No funding was provided by Minnesota for this. So funding for Minnesota is, not, is needed now to provide a statement for future federal grant to complete the final design. Red Wing is a regional center for manufacturing, retail, arts, culture, and tourism. In fact, we are a destination for visitors. Just to let you know that uh, there are river boats on the Mississippi that travel north and south with visitors, and that 
uh, those travel opportunities are, are slated to double and triple over the coming years. And Red Wing is the northernmost part of that uh, reach of these travel companies. So we're going to be seeing a huge increase in tourism from river boats. And I think the opportunity, I think the rail should be a part of this regional growth. And that will benefit the entire state uh, of Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dowse. Uh, we have one more test for but Oh, we just have one more? Yeah, oh, at maybe. least one more, but okay. I, I know of one more. Can we do one more? Okay. I, um, I have, I should explain, I am uh, also the, I, I chair the housing committee in the Minnesota House of Representatives at another location we're doing housing. So um, I just happen to have two, two of my issue areas up at the same time, but I, yeah, I, if I could listen to one. Sure. More. Uh, we have, uh, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate your work, and we have a copy of the re resolutions. Um, Brian Nelson from All Aboard Minnesota. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. I'm Brian Nelson, president of All Aboard Minnesota, which is a nonprofit citizen advocacy group to promote more passenger rail service within the state of Minnesota and to connect us to the upper Midwest. We are very strongly supportive of Representative Hausman's bill to not only fund the second train, but to fund the MnDOT state rail plan. Um, it is our belief that the second train, out of all of the routes proposed within the MnDOT state rail plan, offers the greatest propensity for success, mainly because of two factors. <coughs> because it's relatively low cost to implement the service, and also its projected ridership. As Representative Hausman indicated, we did commission an economic and mobility benefit study for the state around the second train that was published last year. That study is available to you, and we have summarized that for you in a one-sheet overview, which I believe might be included in your packets. But um, I think one of the things that would be very interesting based off the theme of this particular hearing, one of the conclusions of the study is that the second train alone from Twin Cities to Chicago would take an estimated 90,000 riders out of cars. What that means for the state is that it would reduce car miles by 15 million in that corridor. And what that translates into economically is a $32 million reduction in highway maintenance costs. So I think there is a real, real <coughs> economic and mobility benefit that additional rail passenger services can <coughs> offer. And because passenger trains are three times more efficient than light vehicles, there would be a significant reduction in greenhouse gases. So we believe so strongly in the second train that it is our platform that we want the second train extended from St. Paul to Fargo. We're currently modeling out what the economic ROI and mobility benefits would be in that corridor. We will be presenting those findings on October 30th in Moorhead in a public forum. One final note, uh, the United Transportation Union conducted a survey this March about statewide support for more passenger rail and found that 65% of Minnesotans do support a second train from the Twin Cities to Chicago and 73% of Minnesotans support more regional rail service in the state, like, for example, service from the St. Paul area to Fargo, the Twin Cities to Duluth, Twin Cities to Des Moines, Kansas City, etc. So there is widespread support within the state for more real passenger service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for Mr. Nelson? Okay. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify for and against uh, the legislation? We'll take these two gentlemen and then we'll move on to, uh, oh, these three <laughs> folks, and then we'll uh, move on to Representative Torkelson's bill. So if you could please come and uh, State your name for the record. Thank you, Representative Hausman. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That's okay. We, I would love to hear some more. It'll, I think it will be taped, right? So you, you can listen to our tape. And that it's available for anyone. Available for anyone. Please Welcome state your name for the record. Welcome to Winona, and thank you for coming here to, uh, to share with us in this community. Uh, my name is Reggie McLeod. I'm editor and publisher of Big River Magazine, and we cover the Mississippi River from the Twin Cities to the Quad Cities, which is 400 miles other than four states. And 
I wanted to address some concerns. I'm in favor of the second train, but I think there are some issues that uh, should be discussed that would make it more successful. Uh, as it's good to see Minnesota catching up with mass transit. The light rails in the Twin Cities are very impressive. And looking at the second train is, is a really exciting idea. Uh, I just wanted to discuss a couple of practical matters about using the train. I, uh, I do a lot of work up in the Twin Cities and go up there for meetings and return. And right now I can't do that on the train because the train goes up to the Twin Cities at 8 o'clock at night and comes back here at 10 in the morning. And if I were having meetings at uh, you know, midnight or 3 o'clock in the morning, it would be uh, useful for me. But now it's not useful at all for that, as much as I'd like to use it. Uh, right now, if the round trip would cost less than $50. If I drive up there and deduct the business expense, it's about $130. So there are huge advantages for business people like me and in Rochester and La Crosse and so on if we could go up there and do business on the train. Uh, and you could actually work on the train or sleep on the way back. The other side of it is, is I grew up in Michigan and all, pretty much all of my relatives still live in Michigan and I used to take the train out there to Detroit and Ann Arbor uh, to visit, and I can't do that anymore because the trains are from the west. The Empire Builder is so late they won't sell me a ticket to Detroit from Winona anymore because I'd probably miss the connection at Chicago. And I've heard that complaint from many people who would like to use Amtrak and can't. So it would be nice to be able to get to Chicago in time to make that connection and many others. People have difficulty making connections to St. Louis or the East Coast and so on from Chicago. That really undermines the usefulness of Amtrak unless you're just going to Chicago and nowhere else. Also a lot of people from Winona and La Crosse in the area go up to the Twin Cities to use the airport. And again, getting up to the Twin Cities around midnight uh, doesn't help you with your flights and, and you know it just you almost need two trains two additional trains if you're going to really make those schedules work if the schedules don't work I'm not sure who's going to be using the second train and that's really of crucial importance Another thing I think that would be that would be helpful in this, um, you know, as you know, Rochester has been trying to get a zip line up to the Twin Cities, some kind of rail connection, and I think it would be good to look at the possibility of getting a fast rail connection from Rochester to Lake City or Wabasha, which is only about 35 miles, rather than building a whole rail from Rochester up to St. Paul. And of course, if they had that built, they'd want to build another rail from Rochester to La Crosse, and you'd end up dividing this route between St. Paul and Wisconsin into two routes, and they'd probably each have half as much traffic. Whereas if you could get a 35-mile connection from Rochester to the river, and, and if you look at a map, Lake City and, and Wabasha, either one of those would be pretty convenient, then that would make the people in Rochester closer to Chicago and to the Twin Cities. It would be pretty convenient and it would probably add a lot to the traffic um, on that rail corridor along the, along the Mississippi River at a fraction of the cost of building a rail from Rochester up to the Twin Cities. Um, when I do go to Michigan, it's interesting to note there are three round trips every day between Detroit and Chicago. And the Detroit metropolitan area is about the same size as the Twin Cities metropolitan area. And the distance is pretty much the same. And when you have three trains like that running a day, you know, per day, then those are commuter rails. Those are rails that people can use to go to work and do business with regularly 
because they can depend on them and the trains aren't driving, <clears throat> aren't going across the entire continent, so they're a lot more dependable too. That's a good issue to look at. Between Milwaukee and Chicago, there are seven trains going each way daily. And if you're looking at the Midwest, that's the Midwest, and I, I think we could do a lot better than we have been, and it's very exciting for me to see Minnesota taking this stuff. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. You. Are there questions for Mr. McLeod? Okay. Um, I saw a couple of other hands. We're going to take some citizens who have raised their hands uh, first, uh, and I know there's some others that would want to testify, and we'll, we'll take them later. But so citizens uh, who are not involved with a special interest group of some kind, we would like to hear from you now. So please, uh, sir and ma'am, and then we'll conclude our testimony on this, uh, on this bill. Welcome Mr. to the Chairman. committee. Please state your name for the Thank record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is uh, Terry Olson. I reside here in Winona, Minnesota, and um, I'm in favor of the second train, mainly because my business is in Chicago. Um, most of the month I can work remote uh, from my home, but it do, does require me making frequent trips to Chicago and it would be a lot easier to be able to get on a train <laughs> than it is to drive to Chicago, uh, fighting the traffic, finding a parking spot, uh, which I'm well versed in. I, I've never driven to work in my whole work career. I've always taken uh, trains and public transportation. And this was a new one on me when we decided to move back up here to keep on working in Chicago and I have to get in the car and drive all the time. And I'm, so I'm very, very much in favor of uh, having a you know, second train to you. That's thank my comment. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Olson. Any questions, Mr. Olson? Thank you. Oh, we have Ms. Representative Mason has a question for Mr. Olson. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Chair. Uh, just curious as to why you, uh, if you're going doing it on business while you're using the train, maybe rather than a plane? Uh, Mr. Olson. Well, I, it, it's, uh, I look at the Amtrak fares, and they're about half the, uh, most of the time they're about half of what it costs to drive down the road uh, get on a plane in the Chicago. Plus, I don't mind the five or six hours that it would be. My vision of it is, is that the train, uh, the eastbound train, would be departing Winona at about 3.15 in the afternoon going east to Chicago. And I don't mind getting there at 9.15 at night, uh, again, then getting on public transportation to get into our apartment there. Um, it's, it's a lot easier than uh, my experience with airports has been uh, you know, delay after delay after delay. Uh, thank you. Rail travel is yeah. much easier. Thank you for the question and thank you for your testimony. So, ma'am, uh, if you'd like to... Can I make one more point? Uh, I thank the gentleman for okay. his answer. But the other thing I was going to ask, I know people that do not fly, and so they are looking for additional ways to get to Chicago. Okay. Thank you, Representative Mason. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name Thank for the record. You're here to testify specifically on this bill. I'm sorry, could you repeat your name? I'm sorry. My name is Leon, L E O N E, Malchewski from Winona, Minnesota. Okay. And I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee uh, for listening. And a welcome to Winona. Uh, we're delighted to have you in our community and uh, we appreciate your um, listening and uh, uh, wanting to help the entire state of Minnesota with their transportation issues. I am very much as for the TCMC second train. Um, it would be a huge benefit for uh, the community of Winona. And um, so do consider passing uh, the, the bills that are before you. Uh, we have, like was mentioned from Paul and uh, uh, the distinguished gentleman from Red Wing as well, uh, a lot of tourism. We have 
festivals in Europe, in Verona, uh, Shakespeare, Beethoven, uh, frozen film, and of course that was in the middle of the wintertime when roads are kind of icy and not bad and not too good to drive on. And we have a lot of festivals and activities here um, and recreation. Our student body in Winona, I helped Minda do uh, a study with the uh, Midwest Interstate Highway Passenger Rail Commission. And what that whole commission meeting, uh, that study was to look at uh, college and universities to find out what kind of ridership that was used in the entire Midwest. And the results were that 41% in Winona that lived there responded to the survey, do we use the train? And 55% actually mentioned that they would use it more if it were more frequent on-time scheduling and, um, and more options. So for our universities uh, in Winona, St. Mary's and Winona State and the vocational school, this is a very important issue for them to keep their uh, university costs down and to be able to transport back and forth to their home and so forth. Um, tourism is huge here, so uh, we make a lot of money and we're encouraging uh, more so that we can have more uh, state taxes uh, for uh, you and all of the state of Minnesota. Now to get down to what is maybe more gritty and important for all of you to know and to think about is that our um, MnDOT state uh, Freight and Rail uh, Planning Division does not have <coughs> dedicated, sustainable funding. They have to always come to you and say, please, can you give us a little bit more? Can we just have a little bit so we can just, you know, function a little bit? Um, this department <coughs> does a huge amount for the state of Minnesota and for every community in the state. And I want you to realize that when you didn't give enough funding to this uh, particular entity of MnDOT, because they cannot take the, rate of the, uh, sale, the gas tax from the roads and bridges because they're a different section, they can only get it from you. And so right now, it's important to understand what happens if you don't have funding for them on a continual basis. And that is that their workflow is sometimes interrupted. Um, they might lose staffing, which had occurred a, a couple of years ago. Projects are delayed. Um, they won't have the ability, perhaps, to apply for federal grants. And we just talked about the federal grants for all sorts of infrastructure in um, rail and freight and for TCMC train and for other uh, aspects of our transportation system. Um, they are the ones that get those funds and apply for them, but if they don't have the staff, they don't have the funding, they can't do it. And if they don't have the matching dollars, they can't get the funds from the federal government, and those dollars are going to go someplace else, and they need to come here in Minnesota because we need them. Next, we uh, want to let you know that it's important what they do for uh, intermodal uh, transportation. Um, they coordinate, you know, the riverfront, um, barge fleeting, uh, rail, and other freight aspects of transportation all together. And they need that planning dollars to be able to function and make that happen for us. The development and implementation of any intercity passenger rail in the entire state of Minnesota is going to fall into this planning division of MnDOT. And if you don't fund them continuously and without interruption, with dedicated funds, they might not be able to function or even implement or even help in actually operating any passenger rail in the state of Minnesota. This is how critical it is. So please, find some way. And my suggestion is that you take the rail uh, real estate taxes that our CP railroads, BNSF, and so forth pay to the state of Minnesota, plus their diesel fuel gas tax that they pay to go into freight 
and rail. Oh, Ms. Moshevsky, yeah, thank you. Um, we have a number of other people okay, that want I'm to sorry. testify, and if you but can wrap you up quickly or if you're done, done that's great. You can submit written comments. Uh, we'd like to hear all of your comments, and, and if you could submit them in writing to our committee legislative Anybody assistant, else? that would be great. Thank you. Questions? Oh, we have your comments. Excellent. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Thank you. So um, I know that uh, Mr. Qualley wanted to testify on this and the other bills. Uh, Mr. Qualley, I think rather than having you get up, sit down, get up, come back, we'll, we'll have you, uh, it, it, no, 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 we'll have you uh, just summarize all of your comments on all of the bills later uh, during the public testimony. So thank you, members. This will conclude our um, uh, uh, public testimony and um, question and answer on the um, uh, second line to Chicago, and now I'd like to uh, call on Representative Torkelson uh, to present again on an informational basis. Uh, uh, he has a couple of bills as well, um, and uh, those are House Files 2504 and 1930, and um, uh, Representative Torkelson, you also have some testifiers, and we'll, we'll call on them as well. So thank you very much, and you'd prefer to be here as well? Not I here? think I'll stay here too, okay. Mr. Chair, okay. following the lead of Representative Hausman, uh, and the uh, little bit different situation we're in today. So thank you, Mr. Sure. Chair, for hearing these bills. These Both of these bills uh, relate to freight rail uh, in Minnesota, and especially the short line freight rails. Um, you know, we have a class system of railroads uh, in the state and, and in the country. Uh, the class one railroads really operate under the auspices of the federal government. But the short line railroads uh, really need our local state support in order to function. Uh, and these two bills really highlight uh, some of the issues surrounding the short line freight railroads here in Minnesota. Uh, as we've been here in Winona over the last couple of days, uh, We've seen how Winona, in particular, is an important transportation hub. If you go down to the harbor today, you'll see uh, you'll see uh, barges loaded with uh, with the parts for uh, windmills, uh, electric uh, production uh, with windmills. They come in here on barge, but they need to leave here on something, whether it's a train or a truck, in order to get to their final destination. Uh, Anytime we can get heavy freight off of our roads and onto the railroad system, it saves wear and tear on our highway system and leaves room for the people that really need to use the highway to get where they have to go, either with a truck or a car. Uh, and we have seen, you know, the abandonment of many uh, miles of railroad track over the last few decades. Uh, we really can't afford to lose any more, and we need to upgrade upgrade those uh, freight rail lines that we do have in place. Uh, these two bills highlight that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a couple of people here that know a whole lot more about this than I ever will. <laughs> and uh, you, I think these folks would much rather listen to some expert testimony than mine. Well, thank you, Representative Torgelson. I want to underline uh, Chair Beard, Commissioner Beard, please uh, uh, come up. But I also want to underline the importance of these bills to this region as well, uh, just as Representative Hausman's bills were uh, important to this area. Yours are as well. And I'm glad that we have uh, uh, Mr. Beard, who uh, is now a county commissioner in Scott County, but also is here in a different, wearing a different hat today, uh, but really knows a lot about all transportation issues and uh, appreciate you being here. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Beard was also the chair of this committee as well at one time. So welcome back to your committee. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I feel like I'm back home old home week. With some new faces at the table, I see. Um, but yes, thank you for being my loyal uh, foil while I was the chair, as I enjoyed being your loyal foil when you were the chair, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, my name is Mike Beard. I'm here uh, representing the Minnesota Valley Regional Rail Authority from Redwood Falls, Minnesota. My personal home is in Shakopee, Minnesota. My representative is sitting at the table today. Mm -hmm. Representative Taffy, it's good to see you. Thank you. Do. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, two of my favorite topics, well, anything transportation is one of my favorites, but planes and trains are right up there with the best. And so today I'm going to talk about trains, if I may. But before I do, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Wagner is behind me to testify. Yes. And I know you have a hard stop at some point. 
Well, we'll we'd we'd like to stop at five or a little after. We have about eight citizens that want to testify as well. Uh, we can get to them maybe about 20 to five if you need uh, that amount of time or, or less. Well, then I will um, give you the 20 minute version. I'll try my best to okay. give you the six minute version. Okay. Well, I mean, t take take your time, but um, we do have some constraints, and I want to make sure that the citizens know that they are welcome, and you, we will have time to testify. So five, maybe a few minutes after five, is our stop time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've been in front of this committee before uh, on behalf of this, uh, this piece of railroad track, which is 94 miles of freight rail that was abandoned by the Chicago Northwestern in about 1984 or 85 in that time frame. Um, this was originally part of, the, of a grand scheme by investors uh, that formed a company called the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad Company, had grand designs of circumventing Chicago back in the 1880s and we're going to build to Chicago from the Twin Cities. Um, actually, that's where the name St. Louis Park came from, uh, members, because uh, the railroad never reached St. Louis. It made it to Peoria. And so that they somehow mm. prevailed on the city fathers. And what then was, I can't even remember the name of the, of the suburb, but they changed their name to St. Louis Park. Just so that is fascinating, Mr. Ritt. I did not know. Well, they, they, could, <laughs> they could have some credibility to the name of their company, but they were heading for the West Coast. Everybody wanted to get to the Pacific. The line we actually are dealing with today is part of that grand design. Uh, made it as far as the Missouri River at one time and has been abandoned over the years back as far as um, uh, Dawson, Madison, Minnesota. Uh, the, this was abandoned by the Chicago Northwestern in the 1980s, as I mentioned. Uh, it was operated unsuccessfully by some severely undercapitalized short line companies until about the year 2000 when five counties as per Minnesota statute, created a regional rail authority and purchased the line uh, from the trustee. Um, the state of Minnesota has helped with that uh, ever since to the tune of about $34 million to date, which has rebuilt about 41 miles of track with brand new rail ties and ballast and about 15 new bridges, uh, culverts that have been converted to bridges. Uh, what you have in front of you there is a document we prepared a year and a half ago for a Tiger Grant application. Your most recent award to the bonding committee to this rail authority was for $4 million uh, with the permission of the Commissioner of Transportation. We kind of held on to that for about six months and we're going to use that for the local match on the Tiger Grant application. We were not successful in that, so we went ahead and uh, got a phenomenal purchase on some uh, rail and ties and we uh, converted another six miles of the railroad from basically accepted derelict track to class two 25 mile an hour track that can now unhandle uh, today's locomotives and uh, grain cars. Uh, the immediate result of that was a nine million dollar expenditure by South Central Grain and Energy successor company uh, to open a unit train facility for hauling fertilizer inbound uh, in the city of Gibbon, Minnesota. Nine million dollars of new tax base in Gibbon is a really big deal. And that's happened in every small town along this line over the last 15, 17 years as we've been slowly rehabilitating the line heading west. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point out that um, there are a couple of ways we could probably uh, fund these going forward. And when Mr. Wagner comes up to talk about the, the legislation that was passed, I believe, two or three years ago, um, it, it was a takeoff on something we called the FRED study. Uh, back when I had the honor and privilege of chairing this committee, um, bonding uh, requests were coming through pretty regularly from several legislators who had short line railroads in their districts. And the short lines tend to be able to operate and cover the ongoing operations and maintenance, but it's the capital reinvestment that's the hard part. So building off of a change in the Minnesota Constitution in 1978 under the auspices of Governor Al Pui, when southern Minnesota was looking at losing all of the Milwaukee Road, the Minnesota Constitution was changed by the voters to allow the state to actually make direct cash grants and or no interest loans to railroad companies for the purposes of building their infrastructure. They can't buy locomotives or railroad cars, they can't pay salaries or operations, but they can build the infrastructure. That change was made by the voters, I believe it was in 1978, the Minnesota Constitution. So since then, the state has participated in many, uh, re several rebuild programs around the state, including the line that I'm representing in front of you today on behalf of Representative Torkelson. Um, 
that led to discussions about is there a better way to finance this? Is there a better way to do things than have to deal with management budget and have to deal with the bonding committee when there's so many other things that can be done with bonding dollars around the state? Um, and so we formed, uh, asked MnDOT to create a freight rail economic development study, I think it was in 2012, 2011, in that time frame. And it was released in February of 2013. It was released, Mr. Chairman, under your chairmanship. I think it was the day before the Castleton incident. Mm -hmm. And somehow, in all the smoke and no pun intended, uh, the confusion surrounding that whole thing, the Fred release uh, kind of got lost in the shuffle. Uh, good work, however, did come out of that, and that resulted in an amendment to or a change to what we call the Mercy Program, the Minnesota Rail Service Improvement Act, uh, which had become a very small player in the in the uh, ability to rehabilitate shoreline railroads. Our plan was to have that amped up and have MnDOT actually make it a program that could make the grants instead of having to deal with the bond house. Uh, so that change was made uh, just a couple of years ago under Chair Torkelson's uh, um, supervision or guidance and getting that through, and I think Mr. Wagner is going to talk about that a little bit in just a few moments. Regardless, we still have an end-to-end-to-end -to -end -to -end program going on on the Minnesota Valley Rail Authority, and so we have a bond request in front of you for 15 million. Two years ago it was 20 million. That number is specific because we have two more grain elevators who are begging us for uh, 111, 110 ton railroad cars at 25 miles an hour because they're prepared to invest in unit train loading facilities when we get down the hill to the Morton Yard at the Minnesota River. And so that's why the request is in front of you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I could uh, talk about a lot of other things like how Wisconsin does it, how South Dakota does it, how Iowa does it, and how, how, how comes we're left in the dust doing this. <laughs> Doing it this way. But we have your, your questions. Your materials. Uh, questions for, for Mr. Beard, then we'll hear from Mr. Wagner. And I want to just again emphasize uh, there's lots of advantages to this type, and I strongly support this. And, I, and there's advantages to this, and we've been talking a lot about climate, and uh, you know, I think this is a, uh, I mentioned this at the Minnesota Railroad Association conference earlier this summer, and I think this is an important option uh, that is that is beneficial, and also uh, what Representative Torkelson said about wear and tear on our roads. Yes. And uh, we all, all, also get many requests for truck weight exemptions, etc., and uh, on weight, and that you know I, I'm hesitant about that, and and we have an alternative here. So um, thank you. And um, questions for our former colleague. Thank you. And Mr. Wagner, and, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Beard, please stick around. And uh, if you have uh, other things you wanted to, um, you know, highlight uh, in, in Mr. Wagner's conversation, please feel free to do that. And um, may I sit right here beside him? Absolutely. Conversation. Yeah. I'll make sure I speak into the microphone. And again, members, we're we're going to try to wrap this up in ten minutes or so, and then hear from the public that have waited patiently to testify before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee. Uh, I appreciate being here. Mark Wagner is my name. I'm president of the Twin City and Western Railroad, as well as the Minnesota Prairie Line, which operates the line that Mike, Mike, Mr. Beard was talking about. And then I also am president of the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, which is, uh, and thank you, for, Mr. Chair, very much for being at our conference this summer. Uh, I thought your words were well spoken. And I really like that. Um, the recognition that freight rail is the most greenhouse gas friendly land transportation. Um, Twin City and Western measures its fuel consumption and last year we achieved a thousand miles of moving one ton of freight a thousand miles on one gallon of fuel which would equate into if you have a two ton vehicle 500 miles to the gallon. So that's pretty pretty efficient. Um, this bill uh, for the uh, the 10 million to put in this general fund, um, as has been stated, there, the, the map that shows these short lines in the state, um, they can fund their operating things, but they inherited infrastructure that was in bad shape to begin with, and so the chickens are coming home to roost. And I know uh, one of the operators right there in the Twin Cities, John Goldman in the Minnesota Commercial, had the Lionel, uh, Lionel Lakes line uh, rehabilitated and some businesses expanded because of that 
And it's about business development. And the other thing that these short lands can do that the large railroads in the state might not is that we are local. We're in the communities. We're talking to the mayors. We're talking to our county commissioners. And we, we're talking to the businesses. So we're really have our finger on the pulse. And so this would be very, very helpful. We have a lot of needs in the state, and this would be a competitive process, so it wouldn't be just a giveaway, but it would, it would show some tangible e economic benefit. And I'll put in a plug for Winona. I'll admit I got a little bit lost trying to find City Hall, but I did see Bay State Milling. Bay State Milling receives wheat that originates on the Twin City and Western Railroad, so that's pretty cool. Just because the CP goes to Winona doesn't mean Winona doesn't have a short line connection, so this, that was very cool. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, Representative Torkelson. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think we should talk in a little more detail about the Mercy program itself. Um, and my first, the first thing I'd like is to kind of review what's happened quite <coughs> recently with the Mercy program, and those are the allocations that were made from it, including a rather large allocation to the uh, Stone Arch Bridge in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and I've got nothing against the Stone Arch Bridge, but it did uh, make a big dent in our re available resources in the Mercy Fund. But I'd like the testifiers to comment to where we're at with Mercy Funds and uh, that allocation, the other recent allocations uh, that were made from the fund. Uh, Mr. Wagner first, then Mr. Beard, or Mr. Uh, Wagner? Well, I just will make a general comment in that uh, until that provision was changed to a grant, the rules for getting a Mercy loan were very limited. Um, a customer who wants to invest in a freight rail facility to, to ship by rail, they're limited to $200,000. And $200,000 may not even be enough to build the switch connecting to the main track. And so, oops, sorry. Anyways, um, so I think the, to, to make the Mercy Fund more user friendly, uh, I think we need to look at raising that limit to say five hundred or six hundred thousand, because then then you could actually build the facility. Right now, uh, we're currently working on a on a customer from Iowa that wants to build a rail spur to bring up Iowa aggregate in acknowledgement of the impending shortage of Twin Cities supplies of aggregate, and they can do it economically by building this on our short line, but they're running into the same issue that, well, 200,000 doesn't get them too much. So that's kind of the my area, but I'll let... Uh, Mr. Beard? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, <coughs> members, um, yeah, I was thinking, uh, I was thinking I had the awards for this year, but I don't see them in front of me. However, I know there were two that worked to short line railroads that needed some specific help, particularly the Minnesota Commercial, which was struggling with a bridge that had washed out. And there was some, some question on the ownership of the bridge. It appeared that it was a state facility, and they were saying, no, no, it's your facility. Anyhow, the long story short is the bridge is being repaired, and it protects uh, a job base of almost 3,000 jobs up in the New Brighton area. That was under uh, Representative Bernardi's district, I believe. Uh, those jobs were in jeopardy because of uh, the, the rail service was going to be terminated because the bridge was going to be condemned. When we put this together, um, here's kind of what we ran into. Um, there were some issues with bonding that get some, some bond attorneys involved. You know, they get paid by the word and by finding trouble. That's helping. Nothing against them. They protect our creditworthiness and all that. But having small, uh, smaller projects, like particularly shoreline railroads, county rail authorities, and things like that, have to deal with $400 an hour lawyers um, and take sometimes up to a year and a half to get an approval on a funding package when you need to rebuild a switch tomorrow uh, made it very difficult. And so some of my friends at MnDOT suggested that we have MnDOT create a, a fund or a mechanism that could be funded even by bond funds that they could administer and we would, it, it brings some integrity to the process that makes the bond houses comfortable. And that's a very big deal when it comes to shortening timelines and lowering the cost of applying for the money. That is one of the biggest benefits of the new Mercy account. And I applaud uh, you guys for, for passing that here a couple years ago. Um, the railroads aren't that sophisticated that we can, we can do this every time we need another capital improvement fund. 
remember the strictures that Mr. Wagner just talked about. There really, well, there was about a $250,000 cap. That doesn't buy a mainline switch on the Burlington Northern. They're about $600,000 now, I'm told. You might get it for two fifty dollars on March Railroad, but not at the BN. So lifting those restrictions and having them be grants to rail authorities that actually are trying to rebuild their infrastructure or loans to companies that are extending a siding for the purposes of manufacturing more stuff, uh, that has just been a marvelous invention, and it, and it gets us out of the weeds and uh, with the bond council, and it shortens up the application time and the awards so we can actually make gravel and rail fly faster, I guess. Thank you. Are there any uh, additional questions for either testifier? Do you have any final comments? Uh, just a, a couple closing comments, if I may. There are 17 short-line railroads in this state. You wouldn't know that. But every one of them was created by basically entrepreneurial endeavor. There are three of them that are owned by rail authorities. When Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota faced the uh, rail abandonment crisis after the Staggers Rail Act in 1980, uh, they immediately intervened directly and purchased most of the roadbeds themselves, made some grants to help rehabilitate bridges and roadbeds, and then hired operators like Twin City and Western to operate their lines. In Minnesota, we took a different tack. We pretty much said, well, good luck to you there. We hope you make it. Twin City and Western was the one that did. They bought their own railroad. Uh, the Minnesota Prairie Line, the one I represent, the only way they could do it was to take another route that the legislature created in 1982, I think, and that was the regional rail authorities. County rail authorities, regional rail authorities. There are three regionals that own freight railroads the one in Rock Nobles County, ours, and then of course St. Louis County. They actually have lines that actually have freight running on them. Hennepin County too, if you want to count the quarter that Twin City Western runs in. A little bit about what happens. One car in every five for the class ones originates or terminates on a short line railroad. So we play a significant role in the class ones to recognize how important we are in the total transportation mix. Thank you for your attention today. I hope to see you back in session in St. Paul when you can actually vote on this, and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more. Thank you so much. And just uh, uh, to that, uh, we all four of these bills are bonding bills, and uh, this is they will be uh, uh, considered in uh, our, our larger capital investment <coughs> bill that will be a focus of the session. Mr. Wigner, any uh, last comments? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for, for having us here. We really appreciate it. And then... Uh, I would say that Nobles Rock Railroad uh, changed hands about two years ago, and the, the new operator on it is very proactive, so I suspect you will be hearing from them. Um, they've, they've been very active, because the Toronto State Lines goes from Minnesota to South Dakota, and they've been very active in South Dakota, and don't be surprised if they visit you next spring. So, which is a good story, because they too are going after kind of like Laverne and the industries down there, so I think it's a very good thing. Thank you. I want to correct myself. Uh, the second bill that we heard from Representative Torkelson to the general fund, it's not a bonding bill. So uh, <coughs> we'll have to examine that in the context of if we have some supplemental money to <coughs> appropriate. So thank you and uh, appreciate uh, your, uh, your presence here and traveling to Winona. Um, members, we have uh, several uh, citizens of Winona. Uh, in this region that wanted to just testify on various items that uh, on their minds and so um, I will call on them and uh, because our, our time is short I'd ask uh, uh, the citizens to keep it to, to two or three minutes of testimony um, and I have names here I'll just call them and Mr. Qualley I have not forgotten about you and we will we'll call on you after our, uh, our local citizens have had a chance to testify so uh, Emily Falk is uh, Emily here Ah, waiting very patiently in the front row. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Please state your name for the record. My name is Professor Emily Falk. I teach at Winona State University, and I'm the co-leader of the Winona Climate Action Network. We have several of our members here, and uh, thank you so much, Chair Hornstein and representatives, for hearing us speak on the issues of climate and transportation. And uh, our organization has about 200 members on our email list, and we are actively doing um, 
community events in relation to both clean energy and electric vehicles. And we understand that this is a holistic approach, that when you charge your electric vehicle, of course you want it to be charging with clean energy. And so uh, we've had solar power uh, panel discussions. Last night at our meeting we had several representatives uh, speaking about solar energy. And we understand that part of the mix. We also um, have a great interest in being able to select from a wide variety of hybrid and electric vehicles. And we really appreciate Governor Waltz's taking this action to support um, the clean air standards in transportation because in Winona right now at the dealerships there's currently zero electric vehicles in, on the lots. They do not carry them. And with this new uh, standard, they will um, be compelled to bring more plug-in electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids to the lot so that our consumers can have those as choices. Um, and uh, I, I commute by bicycle, actually, and um, I would appreciate if more drivers were driving electric vehicles because then I would not have to breathe in the toxic fumes from their tailpipes when I am riding my bicycle around town. So uh, it is directly related to our health, our clean air, as well as our clean water concerns. And um, today I'm wearing this red dress. I consider myself a water protector. And um, uh, this is the, October is the month for reducing gender-based violence. And this red dress signifies the missing and murdered indigenous women. And so um, all the work that we do to reduce our use of fossil fuels and um, oil will help benefit um, uh, and be in, in solidarity with the indigenous peoples who are working to uh, end um, the use of oil pipelines through treaty lands and, and those kinds of, of um, issues as well. I want to um, say that collectively we can do more than individually, and so we want to be at the table when it comes to regional collaboration on EV corridors. We want to be able to maintain a vibrant downtown, and we see that having electric vehicle chargers, fast electric vehicle chargers downtown, would make a big difference. We have one uh, level two charger downtown at the moment, and having fast chargers downtown would um, be ones that would be universal chargers, that would not just be limited to one car manufacturer. And um, we tried to get Volkswagen settlement monies in the first round and we were denied. And so we really want to have a voice at the table so that we can speak to those concerns. I know that there's um, others in the organization who want to speak, and so I just want to say we want to move as quickly as possible to having more electric vehicles and charger charging infrastructure and um, to uh, work towards uh, building this in a, in a um, bold grassroots movement toward um, reducing this climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, Any questions? Yeah. OK, okay thank you. Uh, is uh, Carrie Heckman here still? Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Carrie Heckman, and I'm part of a grassroots effort to bring fare free trans public transportation to Winona. I first became interested in the issue through my involvement with the Winona Catholic Worker, which offers evening meals to those in need of food or company. One of our regular guests often calls before dinner to see whether anyone will be available to give him a ride home. He takes the bus to us, but dinner is served at 6 o'clock, right around the time the bus stops running. So taking it home afterward isn't an option. If I've biked and no other volunteer is there in the car, I have to tell him, no, I'm sorry. And he's unable to join us. It breaks my heart, and it also got me thinking. Certainly he's not the only person in this town without a car who'd like to go somewhere at night. The buses here don't run on Sundays either, making attending church services, dining out, visiting relatives, Sunday morning activities so many of us value, difficult or impossible for the transit dependent. So I started attending all the meetings I could that had anything to do with transportation, voicing the need for evening and Sunday bus service. At these meetings, I learned that the reason our system provides such limited service is because it's underutilized, and that increasing ridership could lead to expanded service, 
as it would help justify additional investment. I also learned that 80% of the funding for our local transit system comes from the state of Minnesota. Thank you so much. <laughs> and that the other 20% comes primarily from fares, that could come from elsewhere instead. Since then, fare-free transportation has become my passion. Ridership increases dramatically in fare-free systems. Eliminating fares not only eliminates cost as a barrier to using transit, but also makes transit use more convenient for everyone at every income level. No more fumping for fares or needing to carry the correct cash amount for every leg of every journey. Communities with fare-free transportation are often the recipients of awards for livability. Seniors on a fixed income are more likely to want to retire in them. And it feels so friendly to board a bus and not be expected to pay a fare. You just feel like you're winning every time. The bus fare in Winona is only a dollar, which for most people is quite reasonable. But consider for a moment my close neighbor. She's a single mom with a part-time job, and she's transit dependent. She's an excellent mother, so when she needs to run an errand, her three kids generally come along. But if she pays fares for herself and for each of her kids, it's $8 round trip, for <coughs> there, for back. $8 to go to the grocery store, $8 to go to the library, $8 to pick up a prescription. Public transit can be expensive for the user, but it's even more expensive for the taxpayer. It makes much more fiscal sense once you have a system in place and have bought and are maintaining the buses to fill them up. Because as ridership skyrockets, per person costs plummet. Our hope is to raise $347,000, 20% of Winona's tra Winona Transit's general operating costs for 2020 and 2021, the portion not covered by state funds, for a two-year pilot project. We already have the interest and support of Winona State University and are seeking funding partners among Winona businesses and philanthropists. A friend with experience in state government told me, if you want this project taken seriously, you have to get elected officials behind it. So that's why I'm here today. Fair Free Transit has not worked everywhere it's been tried. It's been wonderfully successful though in small urban systems in college towns like Winona. I don't know enough about how state government works to even know what to ask you for, but maybe you know of a way to help make fair free transit in Winona a reality. Because if it happens in Winona, maybe it can also happen in Mankato and Moorhead and Marshall. And maybe it will catch on in other systems around the country and around the world. Think of the global impact on the environment and the local impact on parking and traffic if we could dramatically decrease the number of vehicles on our roads. Imagine the possibilities for the unemployed if lack of transportation ceased to be an obstacle to employment. Envision a future when the elderly no longer need to worry that giving up driving would mean social isolation. And what if you helped to make it all happen? I think you may have received a handout from John Howe. Um, Um, about the Winona Writers Coalition. It was adapted from a website that our group very recently created at WinonaWriters.org. It's a great resource if you'd like to learn more about this project. You can also use the site to get in touch with me. Um, if you have any questions, comments, solutions, or advice, I'd love to hear from you. So thank you, and thank you. You did a great job, and um, I appreciate your work very much. And I think there are other municipalities. I, I think Kansas City has done some work on this. Um, and so, you know, this is not a, 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 an idea that has not, that has not been done in other places successfully. So, uh, you know, we have a free service in downtown Minneapolis, for example. Uh, on on Nicollet Mall, so I, I'm really pleased with that you're you're looking at this, and we will definitely read this and, and take it to heart. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Questions? Okay, members, we just have a few more folks that I want to make sure testify from the local community. Um, uh, Tom is Tom Esden here, and I'd, I'd ask the testifiers again if you could keep it to two minutes or under. We have several others that we want to make sure have the opportunity to testify. So, thank you, Mr. Esden. Welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Tom Esden. I'm a resident of Dakota City, Minnesota, Dakota County. 
um, to about 20 miles south of here. I'd like to talk just briefly, and I'm going to shorten and paraphrase this a little bit to, in the uh, uh, convenience of time here, but um, I want to talk about the, uh, the study Accelerating Electric Vehicle Adoption a vision for Minnesota. I generally support this, and not only am I just a, a, a supporter, but I, I've been living this for the last four years. I've had electric vehicles in the family for the past four years, and two years we've been totally electric. So we've got some experience in driving around the block uh, several times. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about was one of the first strategies that this uh, report talks about is accelerating sales and use. And, and while I'm generally not in favor of government incentives, I'm afraid that this might be an example that could sorely use one. And let me give you a personal example. Um, uh, within the last 30 days, uh, you know, been, went around to the, the dealerships and you've heard that you know, there aren't electric cars available. But I went to the local dealerships and said, hey, can I, can I get an electric car out and talk about it? And, and basically, I was discouraged from looking at electric cars. The dealership told me, you don't want an electric car. They're a pain to drive. They, they, don't, they don't ride well. They don't drive well. You know, and, and they were they, you know, trying to get me into a gasoline car. And I said, well, did you take a look at the electric car I'm driving? You know, I wanted to get another one. And, you know, they you know, kind of joked around. but. Um, I think incentives are something that would help um, uh, fuel this a little bit further. I, I also applaud the governor's announcement of the Minnesota Clean Car <laughs> Standards as another step in that direction again, to force uh, manufacturers and dealerships to uh, provide electric vehicles. Um, and like it was mentioned earlier on the website, you can't even search for an electric car on some of the local dealers' websites. Even though they sell them, their manufacturer offers them, if you go to their website, if you search for it, you can find those cars on their website. So again, offering consumers some type of incentive I think would be a real advantage. This isn't just a problem in Winona, it's a problem throughout the state of Minnesota and the country. A lot of the, the manufacturers just are kind of not very enthused about selling electric cars and having had one in our family. And I'm very enthused. I'm excited uh, for a, a number of different reasons. Um, one of the second uh, ideas talked about in this uh, document is building out the charging infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I think this just goes back to the age-old question of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Um, and, and I think that Tesla has been proving this out since their very beginning, because before they started building cars, they built the infrastructure. And now their cars are selling, uh, you know, if I start comparing any other electric car, Teslas are outselling any other electric car, and I think a, a, a great portion of that is due to their already existing infrastructure. I can travel anywhere in North America, and, and frankly, almost any place in the world, because they built this out. Um, so it, it is important to have the infrastructure, and that's where here in this part of Minnesota, you know, we're an infrastructure <coughs> desert. There are no charging facilities of, of any significance in this part of the state. Uh, and, and thank God for the VW settlement funds because that's where the majority of funds are coming from to fund this. But again, that's focusing on the larger uh, highway corridors, which is important for long distance travel. But I urge you not to forget about uh, the local community chargers, the destination chargers. Because again, as we talk to, to residents within the Winona County and, and we say, you know, would you be interested? Yeah, I'd like to go electric, but without a charger, I've got ranges. I don't know, you know, why would I do this? And, and so we think having chargers within the city that are visible in a very prominent location would help remind residents that, hey, this is a viable option. You can see the charger. I mean, it's not like chargers have big signs like Quick Trip on the gas station. So um, I, I kind of move on. But I, yeah, thank um, you. Um, and I, and I also think that, don't forget about uh, uh, technology and the innovations that are coming along. Some of the, the other uh, impediments to electric cars, you know, is the lack of uh, high density uh, public housing that has charging facilities available. And it's not only the um, sufficiency of electricity in the garages and parking lots, but it's also Wi-Fi. Um, 
a lot of the other manufacturers have announced uh, the availability of over-the-air updates uh, and joining Tesla in that. So that's another uh, factor. And again, while those things might be outside of your purview, it's important that you know this is kind of uh, considered you know as part of a greater transportation. So Thank you for your testimony. If you have something in writing that you could also submit, sure. that's great too. Um, so I'm going to just name the names and so that we can expedite things. Uh, if, if Sheldon Steele is here, I, I, we'd like to hear from Mr. Steele. Uh, if not, uh, if Ch Tony Childeck uh, is here from Rushford. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Tony. And then after Tony, we'll have uh, Janelle uh, Dean and then Scott Sherman. Yes. My name is Tony Claudek. I'm the city administrator in Rushford, Minnesota. A couple of years ago, I got to testify in, in front of the, the committee here. And a couple of years ago, thankfully, uh, the committee led the charge and got us some small city uh, uh, funding. This year, you took a swing at it again. I appreciate it. Didn't quite, quite deliver, but we appreciate it in our small cities. Uh, I, I can get into the details of how many small cities there are throughout the state. I won't do that. I'll just say thank you uh, for what you've done and keep swinging at it. A lot of uh, small cities do use it, and I would defer. Uh, I'm going to do a little promo here. If you want to see what we do with those dollars, and you also want to see how much uh, uh, our small community supports the things that you do at the state level, take a look at our Facebook page. You won't be disappointed. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Tony Plotik, and I will probably be seeing you a little later on this evening. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, is Janelle here? And then uh, Scott Sherman still here also? Okay, you're next. Welcome to the committee. Thanks for your patience and thanks for being here. Thanks for your patience too. Um, I'm Janelle Dean. I live in Minnesota City. It's rural. And um, I don't really like to drive, so extra trains to the cities would be awesome. Um, so I'm in favor of that. Um, but I'm also um, just want to let you know um, I deeply care about the environment. And I'm here to come up and talk about um, clean transportation. And I added another sentence. Um, the MPCA states in the Air We Breathe and Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report, so that's where that data comes from, it's from the MPCA, um, that we failed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to levels set by the Minnesota 2007 Next Generation Energy Act. Because transportation causes over 50% of our total greenhouse gases, the electrification of our transportation system needs to happen as quickly as possible as is being done in other countries such as France and Norway. To meet goals set forth in the Next Generation Energy Act, we need more education and support for electric vehicles. This especially includes supportive infrastructure which allows EVs to easily and quickly charge throughout Minnesota. The Southeast Minnesota Highway 61 corridor is particularly lacking in infrastructure. We need more high-speed charging stations along the 61 corridor north to the cities. I'd like to point out that most EVs are charged at home, but when traveling long distances, EV owners seek out high-speed chargers. The nearest high-speed charger is currently located in Red Wing, Minnesota, and I've learned that people drive EVs, choose to bypass scenic Highway 61 because there are minimal ideal charging options available. I'd also like to let you know that EV drivers want to charge while they dine or shop, so locating stations near local businesses in places like downtowns welcome visitors and helps to increase tourism and income for local businesses and I think makes life like way better than stopping at Walmart or Hy-Vee every time you need a charge. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions we also need to help provide affordable EVs to Minnesotans. I'm so thankful for the Clean Car Standards Initiative set forth by Governor Waltz. This will help quite a bit in moving us forward. I'd also like to say that I brought a petition that was signed by over 200 individuals primarily residing in the Winona area that are, that are in favor of planning for a Winona Transit EV bus and installing a public charging station in downtown Winona. It was not difficult at all to acquire signatures. Some people pulled the clipboard out of my hand um, and I'd say like maybe five out of six people if not more um, wanted to sign the, the petition. And I'd like to say too, that education part is really important because the other people that weren't sure didn't know what an EV was, so I got to educate them on what EVs were. 
So this petition was submitted um, to the city in July, but I regret to inform you that the city administration does not believe the city should be in the business of providing energy to vehicles. The city administration also feels the cost of an EV minibus, such as the city of Winona would need, is cost prohibitive. I would like to ask representatives here today to help provide more financial support to Winona for EV infrastructure and to help Winona transition to being a cleaner city. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have a petition. Yeah, I would, we would very much like a copy of the petition. And thank you for your advocacy. People, it just makes a difference when folks are getting out there and getting petition signatures. And, uh, very much appreciated. Okay, so we're winding down, members. Um, uh, we have um, Scott Sherman and Sam Strenkins, and then we'll hear from Mr. Qualley and anyone else who is not able to testify that wants to. But we have pretty much a hard stop at 5.15 here, so. I'm going to stand. I'm going to talk loud. Good. <laughs> my name's Scott Sherman. I'm a cyclist. This represents my family. Me, my wife, my 19-month-old son. I have another one coming in December. Congratulations. Uh, so I figured these, if nothing else, would stick in your head. You'd be like, that is the guy from Winona who bikes. In town here, I'm known as the bike guy. I'm also known as the outdoor rec guy. Okay? I should also be over at DNR and Legacy Meeting because we have a very important Legacy Grant that we're applying for right now. This one is more important to me because this one involves the safety of the people in our community. I grew up in Egan, west of 35E. I worked at the Shockby Theater. I played soccer in Blaine. Blaine? Another Blaine over here, right? <laughs> yep. I played soccer in the National Sports Center up there. I grew up in the Twin Cities. In the Twin Cities, I have commuted over 26,000 miles by bicycle from Egan to Shoreview. Bloomington, Rosemount. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot on my bicycle. Down here and since, I've put in 100,000 miles on my bicycle. I'm a traveling sales rep by trade. I've driven over a million miles. What does that say? That says that I've seen it all. I've seen it everywhere. I've seen it here in the Twin Cities. Kudos to you. Most of you are from the Twin Cities area. Kudos to the infrastructure that you have designed up there. I used to be able to ride my bike up there. I knew every single person who was on a bicycle. Now I ride, I know no one. Why? Because there are so many cyclists up there. So many people that travel by bicycle. Kudos to each one of you for giving that opportunity to those people. I'm not here for me. I'm here for Winona. I'm here for my community. I'm here for my family. I'm here for my little guy. Reason being, we need bicycle infrastructure, just like the Twin Cities does. I moved here in 1991 to come to school. I moved back up to the Twin Cities. When I came back down here, I saw severe lacking of bicycle infrastructure. I rode my bicycle here today. I came within two feet of being struck today right in front of City Hall as the bus was pulling up by an elderly woman, I'm sorry, an older woman, who just wasn't looking for a bicycle as she pulled out of the grocery store parking lot. Why is that? Because she's not used to having bikes on the streets. Any single piece of funding goes in front of you, please consider bicycle infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, it is there for safety, convenience, health, and wellness. That is what I'm about. That is what I would love to see our legislature be about. I can solve the problems for public health and safety. Ride your bike. Have that infrastructure in place. I can solve the problems from MnDOT. Ride your bike. That's all I have. Thank you very much you. for coming to Winona and being here for us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, is Sam Strenkins here? Okay. Um, Mr. Qualley? And then is there anyone else who is in, uh, in the public here who would like to testify that didn't sign up that wants to? We, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, 
Yeah. So, Mr. Qualley, quickly, you will be our last uh, testifier. Um, I know there were many, many things on your mind, but if you could keep it to a couple of minutes, then we would appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I've had gavels thrown at me before, so <laughs> I will be mercifully brief. My name is Philip Qualley. I'm State Director for the Railroad Workers, and um, I just want to mention that, uh, number one, uh, 39 years I actually hold seniority to switch the Bay State Mill and worked on the Minnesota Valley Line with uh, Mr. Beard, uh, former Chairman Beard. Uh, we support all of the four bills before you today. However, we would like to mention respectfully that with House File 1930, uh, we do believe there should be some element of disclosure, of ownership disclosure. Let me be very clear, we not only support the bill, we think the funding should be much greater. Um, we have absolutely no issue with our fine corporate citizens, the Minnesota Valley Regional Authority or the Twin City and Western. However, you should be aware that uh, in the, with the short line conglomerations across the United States, we simply believe good government and ownership disclosure uh, is reasonable uh, and frankly uh, more funding would be appropriate for the short lines uh, in Minnesota. Um, I have, uh, we have uh, for the 1200 railroad workers in Minnesota, we have delivered a handout to you. This essentially, and for the public, this essentially encapsulates my comments um, and I hope you'll take a look. Uh, we stand by the polling work that was uh, in the uh, handout as well as the, uh, we'd like you to see the Minnesota, or Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, uh, the amount of federal funds that have been sent to Wisconsin, Michigan, and Illinois. And as well, I've put together some excerpts uh, abstracted from the federal uh, state corridors that are being built out across the United States. My closing comment is very simply this. I respect that the state of Minnesota has to be aware of the costs and the many competing needs in our state. But for southeastern Minnesota, of which the Qualley family owns <coughs> in Houston County and the Caledonia area, these state corridor services are essential to the growth of Minnesota. And while we look at it as being an expense, perhaps, it is really an investment with exponential uh, economic return. Business commuters, artists, uh, Tourism, connecting families. I hope you'll take a good look at the two bills, and uh, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Qualley. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, I wanted to see if Representative Torkelson had any final concluding comments. This is our tradition here, and then I'll have a couple of very brief comments, and then we will adjourn. Well, first, I want to make it clear that I never threw my gavel at Mr. Qualley. <laughs> <laughs> I may have thought about it, but I never did it. <laughs> well, I just want to thank, now that's uh, funny. thank my uh, testifiers that came to testify to my bills today. I know they drove quite a ways to come, and I appreciate their expert testimony. I'd like to thank the chair for hearing those bills. Uh, uh, thank you, Rep. Chair Hornstein. I'd like to thank the members who... Uh, paid attention uh, all afternoon. It's been a long, a long session, uh, but I especially thank the community of Winona and the public that uh, members that have come and shown interest in our work. Uh, we, uh, I hope you see that we do work pretty hard uh, at our jobs and try to take in uh, all perspectives as we work through the very difficult work of determining how best to address transportation issues here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, with that, uh, have a great evening, everyone. Yeah, and thank you very much, Representative Torkelson and members and members of the public. Uh, I would just echo what Representative Torkelson said. Uh, you got a little, a little snapshot of generally what we do. And um, I would, uh, again, to the citizens who testified, um, you know, I think all of the issues that you raised will be addressed in the regular session. Uh, I think for the authors of the, the two bills we heard, those bills will be addressed in, in the regular session as well. And, um, and then to the public sector folks, the city and county people, we'll be putting together a, another transportation bill. And, and I think your uh, uh, input is very helpful and valuable with that. I guess for everyone, their, their input is helpful and valuable. So our regular session does start on February 11th. And uh, we'll end, uh, uh, I guess, uh, are you constitutionally required a deadline sometime in uh, the third week of May? What's the date? Usually around May 20th. Yeah, on or around May 20th. And so uh, we uh, welcome all of your involvement and participation. 
uh, up until the session and during the session. Uh, everyone has raised really, really important issues that affect all of us. And so, again, with much appreciation for people's uh, testimony and concern, uh, we will continue to, uh, to, to listen and to, and to be in contact as we develop legislation coming up. So uh, with that, members, uh, uh, before we adjourn, uh, for those uh, members of our committee and staff that are interested, we will be boarding the buses one more time. Uh, we have a quick uh, boat tour to look at some of the bridge infrastructure from a different perspective. And so that will just be about a half hour, but uh, the bus will take us there and then take us back to where we need to be at 6 o'clock today. So uh, with that, we are adjourned. Oh, we got into that one. Didn't we? <laughs> 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 <laughs>